What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with me, your host. Uh, a lot of cool shit to talk about this week. Uh, first of all, last week's episode, a solo episode that I did about my trip to California uh, and how fantastic it was. Uh, so for people that didn't listen to it, an abridged version is I saw this band that got into a bad accident and... Uh, They had to deal with a bunch of shit, and then I went to their coming back show, which uh, was fucking insane. So uh, if you have any interest, listen to that. But the drummer of the band messaged me after I published the podcast, and uh, you know I I posted that picture, and uh, I tagged him in it, and I saw that he liked it, and I was like, oh, that's dope. That's dope that he saw it at least. You know, he saw that I had a memory regarding his band but um he messaged you know i got a message like three hours later i opened it up and it said at ill grip and i was like damn like that's andrew from the ghost inside i know he's the drummer and uh he messaged me and he said yo dude i listened to your entire episode and uh you know basically just like was said he enjoyed my podcast and that was huge to me like for me I mean, I was pumped to be able to, you know, experience that show and like t- to think about that. Like I, I crossed I crossed the the country to go see this concert and I did a recount of it on this podcast and this dude listened to it. It was like an hour and a half of me just rambling like a moron. And he listened to all of it, and he was like, you know, he said he laughed a little bit. He said he teared up whenever I was talking about his dad. And I was like, fuck, that's so sick. Like, for me to give him, like, uh, a little piece of joy through, like, something that I did, I was pumped about it. So uh, I felt I'd bring it up. I mean, it's relative. Um, Anyway, forget about it. So uh, I also told you I've been watching Breaking Bad. And make no mistake, it might be one of the best written shows of all time. Uh, Skyler is the worst worst character of all time in any tv show uh besides for i don't know i don't know she's like the equivalent of ginger in uh casino like that's how terrible she is as a person but uh the show is fantastic i'm like on season two now some crazy shit's going on but uh breaking bad like it's just wild it's wild to rewatch it and like remember all the weird shit that happened in there that you don't that, that you kind of forgot about. I mean, like, that shit was in, like, 2008. Like, it's crazy to think it's that old already. Like, we're fucking, we're getting old. But uh, anyway, I got a great episode this week. Episode 80, 80. We got 80 episodes. We've been running this, uh, we've been running this old dog ragged. Um, and we're at episode 80, and I'm pumped about it. And I got a very, very awesome guest. His name is Travis Paul. And Travis Paul is, you know, he is part of Paul Family Farms. Paul Family Farms is up in uh, Potter County or Galton. I, th- I, th- I, think, I think I'm pronouncing that right. But uh, just like a small town, super, super small town up north. Uh, I think it's like, I think he said it was like two hours north of State College. So we're like four hours away from it probably if we're in Pittsburgh. But, um, you know, uh, he hit me up or, or, or uh, actually Chad from Millie's after I was done doing my podcast with him a couple weeks ago, he hit me up. He was like, yo, dude, there's this maple syrup farm that is up north that they do some awesome stuff. Like you should talk to him. His name's Travis. So uh, I looked him up on uh, Instagram and, you know, he actually, you know, before I even got to, before I even got to reach out to me, reached out to me and he was like, Hey man, if you have any interest, like I would love to come on. And I was like, hell yeah. Like I was already in the process of getting you on this thing. You know, like I, I saw, you know, I, I just asked him a couple questions at the beginning. I was like, so like how long you guys been around? He said it was a fifth generation. I was like, what? 1865 these guys been banging holes in trees and and mining this gold this uh this maple gold but uh 1865 that's crazy that's over i mean that's over 100 years it's is it over 150 years 100 uh, I don't know. It's a long time though, but, uh, he was just super cool. Just talking in our exchange back and forth through like the DMS and shit. And I was like, definitely, we got to do this. They, uh, so basically they're just this family that started out is, you know, they did maple syrup kind of, you know, just in addition to all the other stuff they, they did, they butchered meat for a while. Uh, they did maple syrup. They did, uh, even, they even had like stone quarries on their farm and they, 
they farmed rock, which was which was crazy to me. Like I did not expect that. And uh, you know, more recently they've been ramping up their uh, they've been ramping up their operations and like coming. You know, they're they're full retail now with maple syrup. And then then a few years ago they got into bees. You know, it's a whole different avenue. But you know, they're making honey. They're they're they got this. They got all different kinds of of products that involve their maple syrup. And this whole episode is all about that. And I I swear to you on everything, you know, I talk about this every week, like, yeah, another great episode. And, you know, I don't know. I just think they're all great. And honestly, this is probably my favorite episode. I don't know why. I just think it went so smoothly. I learned so much. And uh, it was just cool to learn about. Like, I, you know, I, I brought it up in the podcast. Like, people think about, like, oh, I'm going to go to a restaurant, get pancakes, waffles, just get this bottle of syrup. But, like, there's so much more. There's so much more to it. And uh, I've just been curious about it. I knew that people were drilling holes in trees, but I didn't understand the process of syrup. And, uh, you know, I talked to... Uh, I talked to Alyssa Fine, the bee, uh, the bee lady, uh, not long ago, but it was awesome to be able to talk to someone else about bees. And uh, Travis and uh, his family, like they got some hives up now. I think they said they have ten hives now, and uh, they just been like they just started this the last few years, so it's like a work in progress. And they're just like you know, it's just a touch and go. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it's just a really, really fantastic episode. You, you know, I'm, I'm pumped about it. So uh, I'll talk, I'll stop talking your ear off. Uh, another thing before I let you go, Travis Paul and Paul Family Farms were gracious enough to give me a treasure trove full of all kinds of goodies that they have. So we have this maple jalapeno blend, uh, which is like a, a dry salt you know, it's a blend with a pink salt, and uh, they teamed up with Steel City Salt, and uh, they created their own blend, which I talk about more with him on the podcast, so I'm not going to break it down again on here, but uh, we got bourbon barrel-aged maple syrup from Wiggle Whiskey, so they, they get barrels from Wiggle Whiskey, and they age their uh, maple syrup in these bourbon barrels, which is awesome to hear about. They do some other cool stuff that we talk about in the conversation. And then, uh, we got a big ass jug of their, uh, their, their maple syrup, you know, their, their, their pride and joy, the cream of the crop, uh, big, big jug. And, uh, Last thing, we get a, uh, a nice jar of their honey, goldenrod honey. And, uh, you know, this is all from their farm, all from their farm, 250 acres. Family's been doing it forever. You know, I was talking to him. He graduated with 28 kids. You know, exactly. 28. I think my high school was 250, and it wasn't even considered to be, like, huge, but like 28 kids is insane. And Travis was able to like kind of break out of that, that small town life. And, you know, he has a great story, traveled all over the world, uh, does a lot of cool stuff. And he's just a really great dude. I'm really pumped that I got to meet him and, uh, become friends with him. But, uh, they, um, I'm sorry, you know, I brought up all the cool shit that they gave us, but we're going to give this away. So, I mean, every morning I post the, the cover art, so you'll, you'll see the cover art on Instagram, but uh, I'll do a follow-up post, and it'll be a, a nice-ass picture that I was outside just now taking in the sunlight, you know, getting, all, getting the ambiance in it, getting the ambiance in it, little sun rays in there. But uh, I'm going to give away all this stuff, and I got, a, I got a fat sticker pack of all I'll Call You Right Back stickers uh, that we're going to give away, and it's it got to be local pickup. If you're listening to the podcast, it's going to be the same type of giveaway. Uh, once I make this post, you'll see it on there. It'll say giveaway alert, and you'll have to tag some people, and you'll have to be following both me on I'll Call You Right Back and Paul Family Farms PA on Instagram. So uh, you have to follow both of us, You know, like it, comment as many times as you want, and uh, Sunday I'm going to pick a random winner, but it got to be local pickup because, like, I mean... I bet you all this shit weighs at least six pounds. I ain't shipping it. So, I mean, you got to meet me somewhere. You know, I'll meet you around Southside. I'll meet you around, you know, Kraft and Ingram, wherever you want. But, you know, I thought I can get through the whole thing without a coffin, but oh well. So, without further ado, a fantastic episode 80 with Travis Paul from Paul Family Farms. 
All right, I'm sorry. I know I said the podcast was going to start, but I wanted to bring up something else. Creatives Drink 10 is at Stage AE tonight. Uh, So I talked to Cody Baker a long time ago. Cody Baker is just a move maker in Pittsburgh, and he put together Creatives Drink 10 at Stage AE. We got a whole night full of shit, and it's from 6 to 11, free to get in. You got have to have a, you have to have a valid ID, and it is absolutely worth going to. You got performances from Benji, Mars Jackson, PK Delay, Fed the God, Pet Zebra, My Favorite Color, Chew Jackson, Sierra Sellers, and so many more people, and uh, it's going to be a great time. I wanted to bring that up in here. I'm going so uh if you guys head down to creatives drink 10 uh i hope to see you there appreciate it and here's the podcast i gotta use the telephone hello I'll call you right back, podcast. I listened to Steve Turner's, and I listened to the guy from Pen Mac. I didn't get all the way through the Pen Mac one yet, so he uh, Adam, he's an interesting dude. Yeah, I. Uh, but that's a perfect example. It's like I'm someone, you know, I like cheese, and uh, yeah. one of the girls that listens to the podcast, she hit me up, and she was like, "Hey, there's this guy at Pen Mac. He's been the cheese guy for like 15 years. He would be cool to hear about." Yeah. And I was like, absolutely, because like, I mean, I I find all my own guests for sure, but uh, let me turn this off. I'm gonna, turn, I'm gonna put my phone in airplane mode too, so it doesn't blow up here. All right, um, but yeah, she hit me up and she was like, you know, uh, I think it would be interesting to hear about different cheeses and how yeah. people like kind of, because like I'm the type of guy who I was raised on like them discount like bricks oh, from yeah. Giant Eagle, yep. you know, just a regular Giant Eagle sharp cheddar, yep. and. Uh, I've like since developed like a taste. Like I like going to try cheese. Like I yep. do coffee or something. Yep. And I wanted to know like more about like how to know what I'm looking yeah. at and how to know what I'm like tasting and yep. what's quality. And uh, anytime anyone hits me up and is like, yo, there's this type of person to yep. talk to. I'll absolutely hit them up. And yep. like, uh, I think, uh, I think, I don't know if you hit me up first or if I hit you guys up, but, but Chad told me about you. He was like, yeah. he, Immediately, once we were done, he was like, "You guys, you got to talk to uh, uh, the farm up here. They they do uh, yep. they do like maple syrup, honey, and everything." And I was yep. like, "Absolutely, that's right in my wheelhouse." So like, I looked you guys up, and I'll pretty much like I'll drill people's social media and just yep. see like make sure they're not you know psychopaths yeah. yep. or Nazis. <laughs> and then like if they seem like gen- genuine people, I'll I'm definitely down yeah. to, to learn yep. about stuff. So. You, you are, you're part of the heritage. You're, you're a Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my name's Travis Paul. So yes. I'm fifth generation with the farm. Fifth. Yep. I looked at that card you posted and when did the farm start? Yeah. So 1865. That's so, insane. Yeah. So my great, great grandfather, William Paul, uh, he was actually in the North as a, uh, for a soldier for the civil war. Okay. So like, which is neat. Cause we actually have like his, like when he was discharged after the Civil War, so we have his papers, really, you know, like at the farm, and so, um, so the original William Paul, eighteen sixty five, um, part of the Homestead Act has where our farm is today. So, so like I'd say, we're Paul Family Farms. We're on Paul Hollow Road, yeah. so the road is actually named after us. Oh so, wow! And where are you guys at? So we're in Potter County. Potter. So yep, North Central PA. Okay. So about as far north and as dead center of the state as you can go. Yeah. So and, and up there is, uh, I mean, it's pretty much in the in the cut, right? Oh yeah. Yep. So I, my senior class, we were public school, and I had twenty eight kids in my senior class. Twenty eight. Yeah. Yep. Now we say to go from my house Holy to my shit. friend's house was thirty six miles, and we went to the same school together. So, oh my god! Yeah, so Walmart's sixty miles from the farm. The mall's almost a hundred miles. See, so. I have a small taste of it. My my, I have relatives that live in Donegal, like right up uh, by Seven Springs. Yeah, but it's yeah. like it's like twenty minutes to Walmart. It's yeah. like not not anything super crazy, but it's definitely far enough where you have to like drive to where you want to go. Yep. Me, I could walk to Giant Eagle right here. Yep. Well, that's what's. It's always funny when I'm home. <clears throat> I feel like my mom's planning her like trip to Walmart like a month from now. And she's like telling her friends, she's like, Hey, I'm going to Walmart in three weeks. What do you need me to pick up? So like, 
Yeah, you got to be more, uh, more. You got to uh, plan. Yeah, you got to plan <laughs> out for that. So you you grew up there. Yeah. Yep. So I grew up there. Um, so then after my, so it's my great grandfather to my great grandfather to my grandfather. Yeah. Um, I knew my grandfather. He passed away when I was fairly young. Okay. Um, but that's really been my dad and his brothers and sisters that have been running the farm since then. So, wow. And you've kind of been in it your entire life. Yeah. So I said when I was 18, I really wanted away from the farm. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I said at that point I was tired of shoveling cow shit, you know, I want to do something different. Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, but I always, and I always, I like the saying, and I, I don't know who made the quote, but you know, at, at 18, my parents seemed like they're the dumbest people in the world. And by yeah. 28, they were the smartest people I knew. Absolutely. And I don't know how they learned so much in 10 years, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, um, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's interesting for sure because like I, I grew up in a, you know, in a bigger town. It's like for me, my high school, we had 250 people I graduated with and like, yep. we're considered to be like, we're not huge, you know what I mean? Right. We're like still uh AAA, but like. Like, what is it like whenever you're a young kid? Like, what are you doing up there? You obviously can't ride your bike 30 miles to your friend's house. Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, we, you know, worked on the farm, you know, so like. Yeah, I feel like that's a given. Yeah. So that's kind of a given. Um, You know, my parents were really good. Like, they knew we lived out of town quite a ways. So they made a point to, like, take us into town and spend time with our friends. Oh, that's awesome. um, But a lot of fishing, a lot of camping, a lot of hunting growing up. That's that's awesome. Those aren't bad things at all. Yeah. I mean, it was a neat way to grow up because you knew everyone yeah. like i remember when i got to college my roommate told me he sat t- he sat next to two people at graduation he'd never seen in his life really and i was like i literally knew every person like five years ahead of me five years behind me because we're yeah. pre-k through 12th in one building so geez in one yeah so i i essentially went to school from the time i was a you know before kindergarten all the way till a senior in one building with the same people pretty yeah. much yeah the same group of people now so. And how old are you right now? Uh, 33. I'll be 34 in December. Okay. So, I mean, geez. So if you're in, you're in like one classroom, it's that small like that. I mean, how, how long was your bus ride? Ours wasn't too bad. We were, so I should say this, our farm's two miles from the bus stop. So Jeez. we had, you were, we'd have to go down the dirt road two miles and that's where they would pick us up. There was another farm kid that they would meet there and then some other kids around the area. <laughs> another so, farm kid. <laughs> yeah. So like there was a group of us that would always kind of, that we'd be there at this, at this, at the end of the dirt road and that's where the bus would pick us up. And then we were like probably 20 minutes bus ride after that. Okay. So, so it's not terrible. Yeah. I, I'm sure there was other people though that had a hike. Yeah. There were people that was like an hour on the bus. Jeez. So, but I, yeah. So I remember because my, my parents would always run us down to the bus stop in the winter time. In the summertime, I'd like to, you know, when it's warmer, I'd ride my bike down. Yeah. Um, and really, so I could just get out of chores when I got home. I didn't want to cut firewood. So then I'd have Absolutely. to like, take time walking home <laughs> or like pedaling the bike up the hill. Now, what was, uh, what was like, you know, school and education like with that small of like, did you feel it was better because there was less people and you got more attention? It's good and bad. Yeah. Um, you know, it's good because like it's really small and you have these really intimate relationships and like you go with the same group. So I think yeah. what's neat is like, you have this, I mean, I have like some of my, my best friends to this day are people that I literally at five years old is like, you know, getting in trouble for mixing the paints together in kindergarten and yeah, our absolutely. whole lives are together. Um, so I think that's good. You have really neat relationships with the teachers cause you essentially have these same teachers, you know, for, you know, really pre K through six, they're together. And then you go to the other side of the building and you're seven through 12, but you still see them people. Right. So it's yeah. like, yep. They're every day. Yep. It's a, such a small town. Um, how many people are in your town? Do you know offhand at all? I think there's like 1,500 in the school district. Oh, so, wow. So like where my parents live in a town in Germania, but it doesn't have a zip code. So it's just- Germania. Like, yeah. Germania is the town that we we claim, but there's no zip code. Yeah. So, so our zip code's <laughs> Gelton. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a- it's just a little kind of, I always say it's, it's just a wide spot in the road. Did you so. have uh, did you have cable or internet? So we had, we, we had cable for a little while, then we didn't have it. And then we got satellite. Yeah. Um, so we had like the giant, you know, satellite dish yeah. that like <laughs> take 10 minutes to change a channel. Um, then we went to like, whatever it is, direct TV and had that. Um, we had dial up probably I'm it was to trash be, it had yeah. to be trash oh yeah it was like so slow Because even my cousin who lived up in donegal it was like theirs was it was trash if we tried to download shit yeah. or like anything it was like days for a song oh yeah 
And uh, oh yeah, that was like <laughs> I remember. I like the one summer I worked on my neighbor's farm while I was working on ours, and I saved all my money to buy a CD burner because I was like, "This is the coolest thing in the world to get a CD burner." Absolutely. And I got it, but then I was like, "I got no music to download." <laughs> so like, I the first song I ever downloaded was "Little Black Backpack." I don't know if you remember that like "Little Black '90s" like trash pop song. I'm sure I do if I yeah. were here, but yeah, it's a, and, and I'm sure that it took forever to. Oh, try it did. To- yeah, and then like you know, then someone calls or dad, mom's oh, got to yeah. use the phone, and then you're like, well, I got to start over tomorrow to download this. So that is crazy. Yeah, it is. It's such a weird like disconnect because it's like you know, I mean, majority of people you wake up and you you walk to the bus, you go to a big ass school, yep. and it's just like every day you like don't think about like you know graduating with 28 people like yep. that's insane so as far as like uh like whenever you were younger did you were you like aware of it like were you aware of it was like th- that your town was small and you were like in this little like bubble kind of you know my family and my my family and like everyone around it because everyone's in the same bubble with you so yeah like, i guess it's yeah that's a good point you don't really know people that travel you don't really like you just assume this is like life. And yeah. cause I always say that the thing for me that blew my mind when I went to college was pizza delivery. Cause I'd never had pizza delivered in my life. Oh like, shit. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so if you want a pizza delivery, we met him halfway. Oh my God. So you'd meet the pizza <laughs> delivery person halfway. So when oh. I got to college, I was like, hold on. Like I don't need to get dressed and drive like 10 minutes to go meet the pizza delivery person. Where'd you go to school? Uh, Juniata college. Juniata, so, where's that? It's a small school near Penn State. It's about fourteen hundred students. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Now, the reason I asked you that before though is because you were saying like whenever you were eighteen, you like wanted to get off the farm. Yeah. And like I was just curious, is like you know, are you like watching things where you're like, damn, like these, there's like a different life out there, like like seeing commercials with like crazy toys and shit, kids at parks. You know, it was more so one. My dad. So I think it's probably like. There's my dad, and then he has two brothers. He has Tim, that's a younger brother. Yeah. An older brother named Bim. His nickname's Bim. His real name's Roy. Yeah. Um, And then he had an older sister, Jeanette. She passed away a couple years ago. And then there was another sister, Judy. Um, And then there's been a lot of other people around the farm that were not blood, but they grew up there on the farm. Pretty Um, much like blood. Yeah, like blood. So, like, we, you know... We have Uncle Kenny, who's like to me is just like family. You know, he's another brother. And yeah, technically not a right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we say shirt tail relation. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, That's a good point. Um, but my family, my whole life, like pushed me and like was like, you're going to go to college, you're going to get an education, you're not going to stay here your whole life. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I can't like looking back on it. Like when I was like 15, 16, like you don't give a shit. You know? You're yeah, like, absolutely. You know, but then like. Looking back on it, I'm so appreciative that, like, because I'm the first person to go to college from my family. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a younger sister. Okay. So, okay. And she lives in the area. Um, you know, she, she, she lives in the area. Her and her boyfriend have been together 14 years now. They oh, have, okay. Yeah. You know, and they love it. They're like the happiest, most content people I know. And, but for me, they, you know, I wanted to leave and I always wanted to travel. That was my thing. Like, I wanted to see other things. Yeah. Um, but it was my family really pushing me to go to college. And so that's awesome. And your parents are both from up there. So it's crazy. So my <clears throat> mom is originally from Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Wow. So she, her family moved up there. Try to remember the whole story, but essentially last six months of her senior year of high school, her family moves up there and buys like, you know, like the 1970s motel where you got yeah. like 11 cabins. And yeah, everything. absolutely. She said she went from a class of like 800 kids to a class of 48. Um, Holy shit. And so for her, it was like her world just got to like, be show shock. Yeah. yeah. So it's then, like, um, but my dad's, you know, born and raised on the farm. You okay. know, he was fourth generation. We're fifth generation. Now, oh yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You told me that. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're So then my mom's been up there now since. Wow. That's you know, pretty interesting. Yeah. 40 years plus. So, huh. That's yeah. pretty cool. So, yeah. I mean, like when you're younger, like what are you doing besides like working on the farm? Like, what are you doing for fun? You read anything like that? You know, so it's crazy. I didn't read a lot growing up. Yeah. Um, I feel like over the last, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I've been catching up on all the things I should have read when I was younger. I'm sure. Um, you know, it was really like you worked on the farm, but I helped a lot of other people around the area. Yeah. You know? So, like, I always like, I worked at a restaurant bussing tables and doing dishes. Um, we actually have a Grand Canyon in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, most people don't know that's the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. Really? Um, it's 18 miles long, um, and they do like raft and canoe trips. And where so, is it? Where is it at? I feel like I'm. I feel like I've had to been there. Yeah, it's in Tioga County, like near Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, like kind of Mansfield. It's a little east of where we're at. I feel like I've had to been there. I was in Boy Scouts for 10 years, and we were just like. I'm sure you guys would have done that. Yeah, we were just gone everywhere, and like yeah. I can't even remember half the places we we even went. Yeah. But it was like we were gone every other weekend. Yeah, someplace different. So I'm sure I've seen that. Yeah. So I was like, I like a canoe and raft guide in the Canyon in high school. Like, oh, that's awesome. I mean, I made 40 bucks a day where you'd work like 16 hours and it was the best job ever. Like, Absolutely. You just so have, you were, you were a guide. Yeah. But guides are pretty like loose generous term. term. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you were just some kid that, that kind of knew what to do. Yeah. Like I was more of like, okay, like I'm going to steer this boat and like tell you like made up stories about like the Eagles that are here. Or you ever have so. anything crazy that happened to you while you were there? Um, you know, I really only one time I like it was always fun and like you'd see wildlife. But I remember one time we had these group of guys and the water was really high. Like it was probably a little higher than normal. Yeah. And, um, from like, we, like a minute we got in the water, they're like, I think there was four or five of them in my, in my raft with me. And like immediately, like one guy pulls a dugout out, the other guy, you know, pulls, pulls a joint out and they just like, (laughs) essentially I just cruise these guys down the Canyon and they just had the best time of their lives. Like they just stoned the entire trip. I was like 15, you know, and just like hanging out. Remember he gave me a $20 tip at the end. It was like more money than I'd ever could imagine. That's life changing. Yeah. 15 years old. You're just like, that's pretty crazy to be 15 because like I've done the Ohio pow white watering and like that shit is sketchy. I think I did it probably whenever I was like 16, like. Like, if there was a 15 year old running it, yeah. I would have been like, this ain't right. But there's no, with nothing like Ohio Pile. Oh, this no, is no, much no, more no. of a leisurely flow. That's yeah. a, it's always, I like all the outdoor stuff. Yeah. I, you know, like I try to, I try to get out as much as I can. I mean, it's like, I am someone that is more, you know, cabin, woods, like yeah. that's where I want to settle down. Yep. But I'm living on like, the very very outer rim of the the city right and it's just like i try to get away at least one weekend a year where i'll just go backpack or camp and like kind of reset something different we gotta get you up to the farm you know i'll definitely go up there so absolutely it's either fun like in the spring when we're making syrup or like in the fall when we're harvesting honey like that's the best times to come up i'll go 100 percent. sign me up so i mean like you got off whenever you were you got off the farm when you were 18 and like you just decided it what'd you go to school for so i so i didn't know what i want to go for originally i want to go for it yeah Um, and so actually my junior summer of high school, I went to Penn State for this thing called the Governor's School. Okay. Um, it's, they don't, it doesn't exist anymore. What is that? It's like, a, essentially you take three college courses over the summer. It's, it was paid for by the school, by the, by the state at that point. Was it one of the things to get you familiar with different yeah. things? Yep. So I was at Penn State. Um, so I went away to that. I went for IT, hated it. I was like, no, nope, there's no way I'm going to go for IT. Like this is, this just wasn't me. I liked, you know, like I liked computers and playing around with it. Like, you know, I think everybody in high school does. Like, then, well, but, but in high school, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but like in high school, are they like directing you as you know, you like, I was, I feel like there wasn't crazy direction in my high school and we had a big ass high school. Yeah. So like, I mean, I was just serving time. Yeah. You know, I was there serving time. There was not really direction on what, like, where you were going to go. It was just like, you're either, you're, I mean, you're going to college, you yeah. know, it, it was still looked down upon to do like a yeah. trade. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was just, it was such a bizarre time. So, like, w- what was it like whenever you're there if it, in that small of a school? Did they have like any sort of like guidance for you? You know, so I had a couple teachers that were like good, like, am- ambassadors, but like, not people that like really pushed me, but I had a yeah. couple people in my life. So one is a gentleman, his name is Harry Paxton. Um, he had he had bought the farm that was next to ours, and this okay. guy was very very successful in life. You yeah, know, you know, with like in my you know multi millionaire, but like one of the nicest, just like genuine people, and he was always like. When I, I mean, from the time I was a little kid going over and like we go over to his farm, he'd always be talking about different things to do and like uh, okay. seeing the world and like traveling. Yeah. Um, and then I was really fortunate. There used to be a program called the McKelvey Foundation. Okay. Um, so this guy, Andy McKelvey, he was the founder of Monster.com. Um, oh, all so this right. guy, billionaire, whatever. Yeah, more money than God. Yeah. He had created this scholarship program called the, called the McKelvey Foundation. And it, you had to be the first generation go to co- or go to college, and you had to be from the most rural parts of New York, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Um, wow! So you checked those boxes. Yeah. So it was a pretty extensive interview process. 
they gave you a lot of money to go to school, a lot, a lot of money. Oh, so that's like, good. It was like twenty two thousand a year that I got. Holy that shit, that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm very thankful for that because I don't know. You know, yeah, I probably would have went to college, but I would have come away with a lot more debt. Absolutely. Um, That's awesome, though. I mean, like, a little bit of, like, help with that. Yeah. But there was a guy who ran the program. His name was Arnold Hillman. Um, and he was just – he's one of those just fantastic human beings. You yeah. know, like, he was he was originally from Brooklyn, moved to, like, Clarion, Pennsylvania. So, like, still pretty rural, what we would consider the city. But yeah, like absolutely. Rural. Um, so he understood like the fears of like a college kid going to going to going or you know a rural kid going to college. And, Absolutely, because like, I remember he um he would always say when he'd kick off these meetings he'd always say, "You're probably gonna think when do I take a shower?" And he's <laughs> as like you don't want to like admit that, but like when you've never really left the home, you don't know anyone that's been to college, you've never traveled, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Well, when do I take a shower?" Like I remember when I went to college, we bought all these blinds for the like for the windows because we assumed there wouldn't be like window <laughs> curtains or blinds so i get to college and i have like you know all my mom's walk curtains and blinds and all yeah. this stuff and we're like oh, whole bed yeah we're like well return this to ames when you get home like you know wow man that i mean like that right there is just like proof that like so many people are so disconnected from it right it's like fucking son-in-law right it's, you ever see that movie with no. paulie shore oh yeah, yeah yeah it's like that girl lives on a farm and like uh somewhere some farmland and had to be like kansas or something yep. and she goes to california to yeah. college and it's just like some crazy shock and her ra is paulie shore yeah and it's just like you know that whole story of like a culture shock yep. and like kind of turning into your own person after yep. that but it's like you said the governor's uh, that what was it called the governor the governor's school it was my first it was at penn state um you know it's kind of a quick it was a quick summer i think it's like six weeks or something it was, they expected a lot. I mean, we took, I was, my course load then was heavier than when I was, was in college because uh, yeah. I think that they knew they had, you know, at that time you're 16, 17, you're on a college campus, you're kind of away from home, but you're not. So they kept us pretty busy. Um, and that was a good experience. Um, but it was really like when I got to Juniata and like had some great professors there and like, I always said, like, looking back, I, I want to believe that I wasn't that rough around the edges, but I'm yeah. sure they were like, who the hell is this kid? <laughs> like, you know, coming in here and like from the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Absolutely. And so, but and, and I mean, like, how did you decide to go there? So part of the scholarship was you had to pick, <clears throat> you had to, there was a group of schools. So you had to go to a small school. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So they said, you know, if you take a kid, which they're right if you would have taken me from my school and dropped me in at, you know, at Penn state, I probably would have washed out right away. Cause Absolutely. then like no one cares. And, um, you're just there. To, it's, I mean, it's like your party shock. Yeah. You're yeah. probably going to go nuts. And so I went to originally when I was at Penn state and then after that summer, then you, you know, like it's your first experience with college. They give you a scholarship for going there. Yeah. And I was going to turn the scholarship down. Like this is how, you know, short sighted you are at 17. Yeah. And I was going to turn the scholarship down and people were like, you know, you should just go see other schools. And I was like, well, Juniata is a half hour away. And so, um, so we were, oh, it was a half hour away from your home from Penn state, uh, Penn, or state. Penn state. Yeah. yeah, yeah about yeah. two and a half hours from home. Okay. Um, so we went and I remember we got there the wrong day. Um, so, you know, you go to, we go, well, we get lost, you know, like we're on lost on campus and we just yeah. stop some kid and he's like, Oh, go over the white building, talk to Norma. She'll take care of you. So we go in she's like, you're supposed to be here tomorrow. We don't have a tour guide. And so we're like feeling like really dumb. We're nervous. We're scared. Absolutely. Say, so call some kid, he like comes over. You can tell he'd just woken up. And like <laughs> he gives us this tour on campus and like it's so pleasant and nice. And I was like, boy, it's, this is nice. Like he's really friendly. Yeah. Um, Made it an inviting yeah. scenario. So then they had me meet with a professor, Dom Peruso, who I still keep in touch with. And so I met with Dom and, you know, super nice guy. And, um, so anyway, we go, we go through all that and I'm leaving. I'm like, but I'm still going to Penn state. You know, I'm like, I'm going to Penn state. I'm going to bleed blue and white. And, yeah. um, so then I go back for a second visit to Juniata. Um, and I'm walking across campus and Dom like sees me and he's like, Travis, Travis. And he like, he's like, Hey, have you made a decision yet? And that's when I made change my mind. I was like, this guy, he remembered, remembered you. me, like remembered our conversation. Wow. And, so then that's I was really like, awesome. Yeah. So like, it's a great school. It's a small school. It's expensive. Yeah. You know, like, um, but it's a, it was a, it was a good fit for me. Good education. You know? Uh, it's a great education. They, um, so junior actually pays if you go a fifth year. So okay. our four year graduation rates like 96%. So if you have to go a fifth year, they'll pay for it. Wow. 
So gave me a chance to study abroad. So I'd never left the country before. So I studied abroad in England with them. Wow. Um, I mean, How they was helped. that? It was amazing, you know. Like, Probably crazy. 28, 28 people in your high school right. and you're going to England? I think at that point, like, you're young. I was just turned – I just turned 21. You know, I was, you know, tougher than everybody else in the world. And yeah. so I got on a plane in Elmira, New York. I landed in Manchester. I went and found a train station and took it to campus. And that was it. Like, I didn't know anybody there. And I wow. didn't go with a group. So it was like – yeah. It wasn't like some study abroad where you have 50 students. It was yeah. me and like three other Americans on campus, huh? 10,000 kids. Jeez, so, that is crazy. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Like, yeah. I would say the first three months, like, I, I, I had a really good time. Like, and I, I like bet. went to Dublin for St. Patty's Day, which is like crazy, I'm yeah. sure. Oh, uh, yeah. And it was, what was fun is like, so not only do you know everyone from your high school, you know all the other high schools because like you play sports and it's such a small area. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so we had like five other friends of mine that like were other colleges from other high schools that were all in Europe at that time. So we all met in Dublin for a week, and so oh damn, that yeah. is crazy. Yeah, then I ran out of money, and then that like you know like <laughs> got well, got a little bit more serious. So. That's a uh, that would be a cool experience. Though. I've yeah. never been out of the country yet. My wife studied in Chile, and uh, oh nice. She uh, she taught talks about how incredible that was and i i, I want to go to europe so bad yeah i think that that's probably at the top of my list of where i want to go is like france and italy and all yep. that uh but i mean i just feel like i don't want to go yet i feel right. like i want to go whenever i have the complete means to do everything i want to yeah. do but uh I don't know. I like traveling. It's so interesting. Yep. I mean, I've never really even been too many places in the U.S. So, like, I'm just trying to hit all different places around yeah. here. It's really awesome, though. Yep. So, I mean, like, you went to school for what was your? Oh yeah. So I um. So I wound up my degree as an entrepreneurship. Okay. Um. So I was the first class that graduated with this. Um. But I also have a degree in finance as well. So my background's really like a finance and accounting, and then entrepreneurship was. Very similar to that. You took a lot of the same courses for Yeah, it, I'm so. sure it kind of rubs the same. Yeah. Now, uh, I mean, like after college, are you like, I mean, are you so actively working with the farm? Yeah. So I would go home in the summer. So I never, I went home every summer. Yeah. Um, at that point, we had started, we had really transitioned out of the animals at that point. So like, you know, we had dairy cows and beef cows and pigs and chickens and horses. And then we got rid of the dairy cows then the beef cows then the pigs then the chickens and um, beef cows, like slaughter and beef yeah, cows. Yep. Yep. It's probably intense. It is. You know, it's, it's a neat thing to learn and know how to do. Yeah. But um, I get it. But that, like the, I always said, I hated the point of the actual, like when you put the animal down, yeah. like how did you just do it? Can I ask you? Yeah. So, um, was it like no country for old men with that? No, we didn't have the money for that. So, but you like, know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's much more like in an industrial setting where you're going to do a lot of them. Yeah, like fifty in yep. two seconds. Yeah. So it's like my dad and his my dad and his brothers, and I always say my dad and his brothers are like the last of the mountain men. Like yeah. they're truly like can do anything with their hands. Like very like burly. Yeah, and it's just like interesting to watch them. But so when we butcher. Um, one, what you do is take it. We'd use a twenty-two magnum, and okay. uh, in the forehead, there's a swirl. So on a pig or a cow, there's a swirl of hair in the forehead. So next time you're close to one, if you are, yeah, look and right in the forehead, there'll be a little swirl. And there's two plates that come together in the head, and, and that's so, the weak point. Yep. Yeah, so um, shoot them with a twenty-two. It usually knocks them out. You know, or 20, twenty-two magnum. Shoot them with that because um, you don't want to shoot them with something that's going to like yeah make them hurt. Yeah, make a mess. Um, and then you slit their throat. So like Jesus. Yeah. So, and you had to do this, uh, you know, it, I was, I would say, you know, we always look back on it now. It seems crazy. My mom wouldn't let me be part of it till I was seven, which now looking back, like till you were seven, yeah, like when I was a kid, I was like five years old crying. Cause I was like, I want to go with dad. And so like, yeah, I was part of it. And like, you, you know, know, it makes sense. And I mean, like I get it, like I get, uh, you know, I love animals and yeah. I, 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 I would never hurt animals like that, but you know, I've hunted, I grew up as a hunter yep. and, uh, you know, it kind of fucked me up. It yeah. kind of fucked me up whenever I, I shot a deer one time and I, I hit this doe in the back and, and yep. she wasn't dead. She was just paralyzed. And like, you know, it's just like, I had to finish her off and it's just like, it kind of fucked me up. But like, yeah. I respect the whole idea of it all. Like I understand right. what happens right. and I understand why it needs to happen and the yep. way it does happen. But it's crazy that, uh, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I would never stop eating meat. Right. 
you know, I, and, but, but that's, that's the cold reality of what it is. Right. It's like, I'll still go to Chick-fil-A. Half yeah. them, half them chickens are t- tortured. Right. I don't know. It's a well, whole different say that thing. It should bother you a little bit. Like if you're someone, it bother if you. you're someone that like enjoys killing an animal, you're probably like, maybe I should, maybe I should go talk to somebody. Yeah. Maybe you know? you're going to be a serial killer. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's interesting, but uh, you know, I respect it. Like my, like I said, I, uh, you know, the closest the closest relation that I have to someone you know rural like yourself is is my cousin and my yeah. my uncle is a hard dude yeah you know like a hard dude to the point where like a cat got uh, ran over by a trailer and broke its leg and he fucking shot it like yep. you know what was he gonna do and and like that happened when we were younger and I remember thinking like that is insane yeah but you know, now that I'm older, I kind of realize that people were 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 groomed in a different lifetime right. than us. But that's interesting. I'm, I mean, I was just curious because, like, you know, it's an interesting yep. broad bringing up. So he's phased out of all the meat and everything. Yeah. Like that. Yep. So we got why we, though? You couldn't make money at it. Oh, okay, you know? that makes sense. It just is, you know, being a small family farm. You know, at that it, you know, at that time, it's just difficult. You know, and it still is difficult. I think yeah. there's a lot of a lot of a lot of resources now that you can like you can put a brand, you can use social media, you can yeah. advertise. But so we got out of that. Um, and then we also had stone quarries on the property. So like really? flagstone. So like nothing major. Um, but we started doing that. So like, this is probably late nineties, early two thousands. Um, really started getting in the, you know, doing flagstone. So we're doing that in addition to the farm. And then now what is flagstone? So like this flat, like the stone you'll see in sidewalks or oh, like yeah, fireplaces yeah, yeah. or stuff. Okay. Yeah. So we did that. We had three quarries at one time that we were running like on our property and a neighbor's property. And how does that work? You dig it out. Yeah. So, so if you ever like drive down the road and you see like the stone, that's like, it looks like it's in layers. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. So, like, oh, okay. so we would go in and you have different and you pull it out and we had saws and you cut it into different sizes. Sizes. There's like exact sizes it needs to be cut for wow. for that. So we did that. Um, 2008, the housing crisis really kind of like you know put a damper on decorative stone. You yeah. know that was like <laughs> pretty unique. And so um, so we kind of moved out of that. And you know my dad and his brother are also loggers, so like they do oh, logging really? for people. They have their CDLs. They run equipment. They my dad's a welder. Men like, of many hats. Yeah, just like hustlers. Got to so, be out there, right? Um, you know, but at the same time, that's where we were like making maple syrup. We we're making a little bit more and a little because bit that's more. that's happening. It all like that's happening all the time while right. all this is going on. Right. So I mean, it might be as little as like some years we just made a couple gallons, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Um. You know, but like my, you know, we've tapped trees on the farm. We have t- trees that were tapped over a hundred years ago. So, really? Like that. My great great grandfather and great grandfather would have tapped and grandfather and so. Wow. So it was sort of like all this time shifting of like, I was a college, you know, at this point I graduate, you know, the housing, my housing market collapses, um, you know, knew there wasn't, I didn't want to go back home at that point. You know, yeah. at this point I'd seen enough. I was like, I really want to travel now. And so took a corporate job um, with a company based here in, in Pittsburgh and yeah. um, got to move all over with them. So, um, so I, I started in Delaware with them. Then I went out to Chicago, then Arena. Delaware. Yeah. Yeah, wow. so, so it's just like the Wayne's World. Yeah, like, oh, look, hi, you're I'm in Delaware. Delaware. <laughs> um, I always think of that when someone mentions yeah. Delaware, but no one has ever, no one ever gets the joke whenever I try to make it. Oh yeah, it. I made it when I first started there, and people yeah. were like so offended by it. And they're like, "There's all these great things in the state," and like I've been to Rehoboth, yeah, and that was cool whenever I went there. But I don't think I've ever been anywhere else in Delaware. So they used to have this thing in Delaware called Pumpkin Chunkin. Um, uh, yeah, it's like a trebuchet. Yeah, like where they see you can shoot a pumpkin the furthest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like what you saw on the Discovery Channel was not what it was like there. This was like uh. the craziest party <laughs> I've ever been to in my life. Like it probably was just chaos. Yeah, it was like a hundred thousand people, like kegs in a field, and uh. like so we had that in Delaware. You had the beach, you know, like um, yeah. So I started there. Um, then I went out to Chicago for a little while for work. Like um, city Chicago? Um, I was out in like western suburbs, like St. Oh, Charles okay. area. So, so it was not too bad? No, I mean, that was neat because it was like Delaware wasn't that big of a change. Yeah. Um, I had a Sonic. I remember that. I was like, wow, I've never seen a Sonic in real life. Like, Really? Yeah. So <laughs> like that was my first stop. I like get off the exit and I see a Sonic and went right in. And yeah, got, like, got it together. Tater tots and whatever. <laughs> 
Um, after that, I went out to Reno. Um, so I was in Reno for, for about a year. Um, really? We were opening a manufacturing plant there. So I was finance guy as we opened it. Um, How was it out there? Uh, I always said everybody in Reno is either running from something or looking for something. <laughs> and neither one of them is good. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're all not, not yeah. good things. You're like out here in the desert. Drugs, like women, a yeah. place to bury someone. Yeah, I always remember this <laughs> one guy that we hired at the plant was like a bookie for the casinos. And I don't know whatever happened, you know, like why he quit being a bookie. Um, but so this guy's like one of the most intelligent people I ever met, knew more about sports than anyone I ever knew. Yeah. But like, I was always like, what are you going to do? He's like, when I retire, I'm going to move to Singapore. And I was like, all right, like, okay. Like, <laughs> and so I remember when we worked there, he had like, he drove this like 1980 something like Toyota Corolla and someone stole it, but the guy carried full coverage on it. Uh. So I remember the insurance adjuster coming and being like, yeah, I've never had somebody that had like a 30 year old car with full and full coverage on it. That's so, so funny. And now he's in Singapore. Honest to God. Like, Oh, he is there. Yeah. He retired, moved to Singapore. Wow. So, good for him. Yeah. So then, um, I went to Atlanta, uh, after that. Um, then I moved to Louisville for a real short period, which is an awesome city. Uh, yeah. Loved, loved Louisville. It's a fun town. Um, then, uh, I spent three years in Puerto Rico. So really, yeah. So I was Puerto down, Rico. Yep. So we did, we bought a company and I moved Jesus. down there to, to do the, to do the acquisition of the company and the integration. And now, like, did you like moving around and doing all this or was that something that you didn't have a choice with? Really? Um, I really liked it. I raised my hand a lot you oh, know? Okay. Like, yeah, yeah. I, cause I was like, I was like, boy, here's my chance that I'm like, I actually have some money now. Yeah. Um, the company's paying for me to travel and move. Yeah, I want to see not, everything right? and like. Um, the Puerto Rico like thing changed my life, you know, forever, like in a lot of good ways. And like, um, cause that was like, every time was like a little bit more outside my comfort zone, but this one was like, now you're not going to college where there's a safety net in another country. Like yeah. you're down there, you don't know the language. Like, yeah, you didn't speak any, I thought I did, you know, but like you get down there and after the first day, I remember I the thought I did Yeah, the first day I got home. I remember, I remember calling um, my friend. I was like, I don't think I can take the job. I was like, I don't, can't drive in this traffic. I can't speak Ugh. the language. And then like by the end of it, it was just such, such an amazing experience. Yeah. So, but that, when I got done with that role, so that's now, that's when I came, when I moved to Pittsburgh. Um, How long ago was that? Uh, a little over three years ago now. So, three years ago. Yeah. Okay. Three and a half years. Um, Did you pick up some, some language down there? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, it's not as good as it used to be. It's enough you know? to work in so, a kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, when I was there every day and speaking it, like I felt really comfortable, but yeah. now it's like, if I go to like, you know, if I go to Plaza Azteca and Robinson, I speak Spanish. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, but it's just, you don't speak it enough now. To yeah. Like, so my, my wife, she uh, went to school for it and you know, she works at uh, PNC and yeah. it's just like, she doesn't use it too much. Right. Like, and we'll watch things like we watched, uh, there's a show called like taco Chronicles. It's on Netflix. Now we yeah. just put it on and it was all in Spanish. And I'm like, you picking any of this up? And she's like, yeah, she was like, I need to start. I need yeah. to get back into it. Yeah. It's just one of those things when you're not taught, when you're not speaking it every day, you gotta like, work that muscle out. Yeah, exactly. So, so then when I came to Pittsburgh though, was when at this point now I'd been away, been away from home. I didn't make it home a lot during those years. Cause yeah. I was just living away and, you know, making my bones working like that. And when I got to Pittsburgh, I was like, you know, I really want to start doing more with the farm. And at the same time as when really my dad and his brother and a, a cousin who's involved with the farm, those three said, you know what, I think that there's an opportunity to really grow the maple syrup business. And at first, I, you know, I'm coming from like corporate America, like finance background, like, you know, everything's got to be the numbers and test yeah. all of it. And I was like, so we went through a lot. We did a lot of work and we, you know, put together a business plan and we said, you know what, let's do this and let's really expand from like a little shack making, you know, tiny bit of syrup, you know, a couple hundred gallons, maybe, you know. Is that what it was before? Like three years ago yeah, was like a couple hundred? Yeah, probably more like four or five years ago. It was just a, like a couple hundred gallons, like nothing, nothing major. And we said, let's really do this. And so um, they built a building, so like they built everything themselves. We got new equipment. We you know put lines in the woods and really said, okay, we're gonna really shift the focus of the farm from a lot of other things to like this being the main thing for us. So, now, now let me put a pin in that and let's get back to the beginning yeah, of all yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So the beginning of all this, like, like how big is is your property? Yeah, so we we own about two hundred and fifty acres today. Okay, um, so and two hundred and fifty acres. Now, did you start out with that, or is did, that's what you expanded to? That's so. I would say the farms kind of contracted and swelled over the last one hundred and fifty okay. years. So okay, so like in the beginning, I mean, 
when you guys started this in like when did you start making more than what you were actually using like oh uh, boy that's probably been closer to maybe 10 years now that okay. like we said so we always like sort of was like we made a little bit it might be some friends other years we might yeah, not yeah. do it at all friends people local yeah. people whatever yep so but- then it was it started really my cousin um Aaron and then my dad my dad Bud and then his brother Tim it was like you know, like a metal lean to shack and it became more of like hobby. Then we made a little bit more than like a hobbyist. Um, then we made like, I don't know, maybe a hundred gallons the one year. And, and, when, and, and it went, if you had to guess, what year would that be? I'm tr- This is probably 2013 ish. Oh, okay. Okay. Frame. Yeah. Now while you're doing this, like, like, can you walk me through like the process of just that small scale yep. before you guys start getting crazy? Yeah. So at this point, um, like, we have like a small shack. Um, we had a two by six evaporator. So like, yeah, actually probably smaller than like the coffee table here. Yeah. You know? like, and so we would, we, we did put lines up at that point. We had some buckets, we put lines up and then we had everything in like a tank that we'd put in the back of a pickup truck and bring over and boil. And so it was a long, like it took a long time to boil and make syrup. So like what yeah. comes out of the tree is like two and a half percent sugar. Yeah. You have to boil that till it hits 66, 68% sugar. Now, how long does it, so you tap a tree. Yep. Now, first of all, like how long does a tree have to grow before you could tap it? Yeah. So it's really about 30 years. So oh, if, shit. Yeah, if, if you and I went and plant some maple trees in your yard right yeah. now, 30 years from now is when like we'd start getting some sap out. I went to go to the Sequoia forest. I I went to Sequoia in Chicago or I mean, California and I bought a Sequoia seed. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I was like, if we plant this now in in 90 decades, it'll be fucking huge. Yeah. uh, I I mean, I didn't understand how quick it was because I, I, you know, I do my research for this for sure. And uh, do you use sugar? Uh, they, what are they called? Sugar maples? Yeah. So we tap mostly sugar maples. Sugar maples. So like here in Pennsylvania, you're gonna have sugar maple maples, and you also have another type of maple that will produce that will produce uh, sap with sugar in it as well. Doesn't produce as well, so ours is almost all sugar maple on the farm. So. Now, now you guys like in the beginning, you guess you just had this on your property, or you wanted to? Yeah. So we actually have two sections of the farm that are known as the sugar bush. Um, so oh, okay. Like, and so even when we weren't making maple syrup, that was like. Oh, it's in the sugar bush or like it's that area of the farm. So like this had been something that like for the generations, regardless of how much we were making, like those areas were there. there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like in that, in them areas, like how, how, like how big are those? I mean, so we don't tap a tree that's less than nine inches in diameter. Oh, okay. So that's the smallest that will go. Now, how do you test if a tree is ready to be tapped? Really just that diameter test. Oh, okay. Yep. So like you start seeing saplings and stuff, but really nine inches is about the smallest that will go. Um, And then we'll tap trees. I mean, some of those trees are probably two, two and a half feet in diameter. So they're really large ones. Now, what is like, like when you're tapping it, what do you bore out a hole? Yeah, so what you do is, um, you, so you, tapping really happens in February. So okay. um, we try to have everything tap by Valentine's Day. All so right. right now we're tapping over 6,000 trees. 6,000? 6, yep. So, Holy shit. Yep, so 6,000. My, my dad and his brother Tim and his brother Kenny, they really do all that in about, usually about five days. So like, to, to tap all this? Yeah, yep. Wow. So DeWalt, like the drill company, actually makes a drill just for tapping trees. So like, wow. So it has like a guard on it, so you don't drill too far into the tree. Um, you has you know has longer battery lives. Is the so, sap in the center of a tree, or is it on like an outer layer of it? So it's really on the outer layer of it. So oh, you don't, okay. we don't, you really don't want to go much more than maybe like an inch into the tree. So like, oh, only that bit. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So you go in. You drill it, and then we'll get all the taps put in. Um, so try to have everything tapped by Valentine's Day is like sort of the the, the rule of thumb for it. Yeah. Um, and at that point, get everything tapped um, by Valentine's Day, and then sap runs. Um, you know, really, we want nice sunny days. And you want it above freezing during the day, below freezing at night, and before the maples bloom. So once maples bloom, you're done. Yeah. Um, but you want it really cold at night. Let those trees reset. And then you want it to warm back up in the sun, in the daytime. And is it all gravity fed? So we actually have a vacuum on ours. Um, so um, our six thousand taps right now. It's it looks like a giant spider web. So you start yeah. from like a quarter inch line to a half inch to an inch to a two inch and line. And these just like uh, flexible plastic pipes. Yeah, it's actually plastic made. It's tubing just for maple syrup. So you'd never uh, use it for anything else. Okay. So. 
So I think, you know, in our main section, we have 53 main lines that are an inch line. Um, the shortest one's a thousand feet. So like, and as it's going through this, it's, it's not like a, it's not like a full stream of it. It's just like a, no. So like when the days that it runs and the vacuum's on there, so it's about a quarter mile from the house, uh-huh. you can actually hear it running off the mountain, which I know sounds crazy, Really, but like, so I'll maybe put it in this perspective like this. Our tank that sits in the wood is a 5,000 gallon tank. Yeah. So like there's been times in a 24 hour period where we've picked up that 5,000 gallon tank four times in a day. So Holy collected like shit. 20,000 gallons of sap in a day. Well, the reason I ask that is because like, you know, you see syrup in a bottle. Right. And like, that's just a generic and it looks like it's just, you know, it looks like molasses slow. Right. Now, whenever you're taking the sap out of this tree, is it is it more of a liquid? Yeah. So what comes out of the tree at that point is going to be very much like water. So it's going to be oh, like, really? yeah, it's like water. Um it, it'll taste like maple water. So like hmm. now there's going to be like dirt and stuff in it, but the sap is about two and a half percent sugar. Um, and that's really probably like an average. It might be a little bit higher in the spring. Yeah. As the season goes on, your sugar content drops. Okay. Um, so I would say like in the beginning of the season, it'll take about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. Um, oh, shit. By the end of the season, I think our last batch this year, we were over 100 gallons of sap to one gallon of syrup. So as that oh, sugar wow. content drops, you have to boil and boil and more and more. Further. So like, so we say sixty gallons is about our average for the farm of how many gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. And and wow, that is crazy. So like that quart that we have here on the table, that took fifteen gallons of sap to make. That's insane. Yeah. That's what uh, it was. It, Chad was telling me crazy stuff about like the dairy that he needs to be able to make like the yeah. ice cream. It was just like blowing my mind, like how much you need to put into it yep. to get it out. It's I, whenever I deliver to Chad, we wind up sitting on like the tailgate of the truck and we just like talk about like because I find it so fascinating what he does because I have no idea how to make ice cream. And I'm and sure like, it's the same as yeah, what you're doing. Yeah, so it's been it's it's neat the some of the similarities between the two of them. Yeah, I'm sure that they're both a in depth process. So yep. I mean, you have this so so you you guys have these main trees and you have this vacuum on there yep. and this vacuum is is pulling all this sap out of these trees yep now whenever you tap a tree could you have like a dud like could there be a tree that has nothing in it uh if you would know right away because the tree is going to look dead you know so oh, like the okay. only way that it wouldn't produce is if the tree was dead so. okay so you get all that now now what's the next step of that process you're sucking this all down yep. into the tank yeah so i think one of the things that's interesting because it's on a vacuum a vacuum only works if all the taps are in um, oh, yeah, so you think about it, like if a tap comes out, squirrel chews a hole in the line, a yeah, bear, you won't get nothing. You know, the, the, the pressure drops. So we have a pressure gauge on it. Oh, wow. And, um, but you figure with that main line, we have 53 lines that come off of that. So, yeah. Um, so you start to think about it. How in the world am I going to know where my leak is in the woods? And um, so my dad and his brothers hmm. came up with this idea that each one, of the, each one of the main lines has a valve on it with a number. So one stands with the radio and the other one starts walking up the woods and they ah. turn those valves and they say, okay, when you turn number five, well, the pressure goes back up. So I know the leaks off of that line somewhere. Damn. So like, it's like one of those things that like, it would only take someone that like, you know, growing up, like, you know, with their hands and their farm to come up with a simple solution like yeah, that absolutely. versus like, cause you can buy things that are like these, these like, you know, automated systems that monitor all of it, you know, for thousands of dollars, yeah, or you can just put a, I'm sure your dad's valve. the type of guy. It's like the more shit that's involved, the more it oh, yeah. can break. And, uh, I mean, so that brings up another good question is like, do you have a lot of like different things that you have to deal with as far as like, you know, like rodents, like squirrels? Yeah. All that stuff. Squirrels are terrible. What about bears? Bears, well, it usually like only young bears will do it. Like the cubs, they'll bite the lines to get the sap out. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, we have a lot more issues with porcupines and squirrels. Those are porcupines. Yeah, porcupines will like they'll eat anything. You know, so like <laughs> you see porcupines, oh, yeah. like wild porcupines. Yep. yep. And they're big and crazy looking. Yeah, yeah. So you can shoot ten porcupines a year with your hunting license. So like, what do you even use them for? You don't. You just eat to get, them? Just get them out the sugar bush. You know, so like wow yeah so i i guess you could eat them i don't know like wow so. porcupines that's yeah. pretty crazy yeah that's por- porcupines squirrels the bears a little bit like it's usually like one cub or something you'll like it's that's not as bad as you would think it would be yeah so, but and and i mean so you're that's pretty crazy with the valves the two yeah. valve system that's pretty yeah. interesting 
So then everything from there collects into our, our 5,000 gallon tank. Yeah. And then from there we truck it about a quarter mile. Um, so we truck that up to where the sugar shack is. So, yeah. um, so we have like this old 1970s, like international flatbed that like, you know, is it's so basic, like, and, um, like to get it to start, you know, so one of you have, you have to blow ether in the engine in the morning to get it to start. And oh like, my. You know, but like, it's just great. It's ran forever. We've had it. I don't know how long. So we truck it up to the sugar shack. <laughs> um, and then what we do is we, we pump it off into storage there. And so where it gets neat is then we run our sap through a, a reverse osmosis machine. Yeah. Um, so the same thing you do to desalinate water. So you think it's a very similar process where you're now taking the syrup and you're making a concentrate and then you have water that comes off of it. So yeah, you're taking the water out of this sap, right? Right. Right. So, so we have a back feed tank of like the cleanest water you could ever imagine tasting. Like this stuff runs through the RO, you know, it's super high pressured filter process. Yeah. And then the concentrate goes into another tank. So then that concentrate, well, now what was two and a half percent sugar might be 16% sugar. Ah, um, okay. Because you took out all the water. Right. Took out all the water. Ah, okay. So that, that feeds to the back, which is, is my second, one of my other favorite inventions, maybe not the second. So you think about it, then the sap comes into the evaporator. So our evaporator now is three feet wide and 10 feet long. Yeah. Um, so much bigger than what we had before. Absolutely. We still wood fire everything. So, so it takes a lot longer to boil it. Yeah. So uh, we, we like the wood one cause we have, you know, a lot of woods on the farm, Yeah. but the flavor is just so much better. So you get sort of the smoky flavor to it. Takes a lot longer than if you're boiling over natural gas or fuel oil or something like that. Now I was looking in my research and they said that, uh, there are this new technology of steam, Yep. uh, where it just, it, it takes things with steam way quicker and you could do like 50,000 gallons of syrup in like four minutes or something. Yep. And they said that people that use it, like boil it over a wood fire, it could take four to like 90 hours. It all yep. depends. Yep. Is that true? Yeah, for sure. So boiling. So our best days, um, when we're like really just things are going well, we'll make a hundred and 150 gallons of syrup, finished syrup in a day. In a day. Yep. In a day. And by a day, that's like 14 hours, like, you know, wow. a good honest day's work. Um, the new steam machines are really neat. Um, you can definitely make a lot more syrup with those. I think the things that personally I think is different is one, there's no smell to it cause it's all contained and that's how they get that temperature so high. Yeah. So like when you walk in our sugar shack, there's no better smell in the world than like you open these doors and it's just like this maple, like steam oh. mist smoke. That's like the most delicious thing. I you bet it imagine. smells unreal. So like you miss that. The other thing is, you think about it, it's like cooking anything. Like the slower it takes, usually a better flavor you get. With yeah, ours, absolutely. it takes a lot more time than sort of you're just processing it's it. It's like if you machine. have a ga- a propane grill versus a charcoal grill, right. it's like the charcoal is always going to taste better. Right. But the, it's a pain in the ass to do. Right. I mean, you guys are dealing with it. Right. And doing it the right, doing it the right way, yeah. I guess. So we, I mean, I think everyone has their place, you know, in terms of yeah, where absolutely. that falls in. But like, we like the wood fire. We like the flavor. We like the process of it. Now, how long does it take you to boil? Like, like, what is your? How much are you boiling at one time, and how long does it take to boil? Yeah. So we, so you have we have the tanks that sit out back that concentrate goes into. Yeah. When the days are flowing well, from the time that you know, kind of the process that they have is that my dad is going down. He's picking up sap. He's checking lines in the woods. He's looking for leaks. Yeah. Um, it comes in, it hits the reverse osmosis machine, it then goes to the back to the concentrate tank. And if we do it right, it's a constant feed, or uh, then it's okay. coming into that evaporator. And that evaporator has like big grooves through it where the sap runs through, yeah. and it sits on just a slight angle. So you think about it as the denser it becomes towards syrup, the more it moves towards the front of the pans. Ah, um, okay. So hopefully it's a continuous process of us making syrup throughout, yeah. the, that, throughout the day. Um, and so... My dad and his brothers are very, very strict about like checking what the sugar content is constantly, what the temperatures are. But the big thing is, is you never want to drain that, that concentrate tank in the back. So like our evaporator, so like on the doors of it, we have like a heat gun. And so the doors have been over 1500 degrees on that evaporator. Like I mean, we're feeding this thing with wood. Non-stop. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. So it gets so hot. Well, the last thing you want to do is you last thing you want to do is drain that that concentrate tank because now you have something that's sitting who knows two thousand degrees in the box and there's no sap in there, so you'll burn holes in the bottom of the pan. Yeah. So what they did was 
they put like a back feed in with a clear tube and it runs up the wall and it says tanks full halfway stop. Oh, so it like tells you the level that's right. in there. So what they did is they built back pressure on that. So uh, then as the tank gets lower, that eyesight. Again, one of those things that like you think about it like, okay, the tank's outside. How do I know if I'm going to run out? And like the simplest thing was just a piece of tube that went up the wall that yeah. they stapled there. So just a bunch of yeah. guys, mountain men living right. on a farm, so making do. It's funny because my fiance, she's an engineer. Yeah. And whenever she goes home, she's like blown away by like <laughs> their engineering. And she's like, do they realize that they're like, they're engineers, they're chemists. And I'm like, <laughs> no, they're just here knowing what they know how to do. So. Yeah. They make it, they, they come to a problem and then they, they find a way to solve it yep. efficiently and cost effectively. Yep. I mean, you got to do it. It's like, you know, my yeah. father's the same way. It's like he has never bought a brand new car. He has never bought brand new tools. He's never bought anything. Yeah. He's just the guy that goes to the flea market, buys something broken and fixes it. And it yep. runs, it's still running today. Yep. His his dump truck is the same way as yours. It's like, I've had, the, he's had that dump truck longer than I've been alive. I'm 29 and it just, you know, you, yeah. you started, it starts. Yep. It's, it's yeah, it's nuts. always amazing. I'm sure like your dad, you've been around him and I'm like, how do they just know how to do this much stuff? That's what you I'm know? saying, like, man. And I do not know how to do it all. I've talked about it on here a hundred times. My father was so good at everything yeah. that I didn't have to worry about it whenever I was younger. If yeah. my car got messed up, he would fix it because you know, like he'd be able to do it in one fourth the time I could the right way rather yep. than me just like fumbling through it the whole time yeah but uh it's interesting it's just that you know men that uh, were yeah. living different the, generations different generations that's what it yeah. is we're all i mean i'm more coddled for sure oh yeah oh <laughs> much more coddled yeah than- I mean, like it's crazy but i mean that's that's awesome that they're that they that they like create solutions yep to make their processes run a little bit smoother yep so, I mean, like you're boiling all this down and then. Yeah. So it comes through and it's coming through different pans. And so they're constantly checking it to make sure that it's boiling right. You know, cause some days, like some days if it's like really cloudy out, you know, it won't boil as well. And yeah. so as it gets to the front of the pan, syrup boils somewhere around seven degrees over the boiling point of water. So like, okay. so if we're say boiling's 212, we're like 219, sometimes it's 216, sometimes it's. 222. Yeah. But what they do is they have a hydrometer that they're constantly testing what that sugar content is. Ah. So like, I mean, they test it like constantly. It's just a constant motion of like checking the RO, checking the evaporator, checking that and loading it with firewood. And um, so what they do is we have an automatic draw off. And so what that means is on the side of the evaporator, we have this draw off and you set the temperature to what syrup's boiling at. So then so let's say you've tested it with your hydrometer and it's now at syrup and it's 217.6. Yeah. We set that draw off to 217.6. So when it hits that temperature, it automatically opens up and then syrup pours out of the machine. Ah, okay. So then so what it, it does. It knows when it's done. Yep. So it knows when it's done. It goes in like a big vat, what we call a draw off tank. And then from there, we immediately run it through a filter press. So like the same thing you'd press like juice with or wine. Yeah. So it's like 10 plates of filter and it runs through that press and then it filters it and cleans it out quite a bit. So so that way, like if you look at the syrup, like if you look at it in glass, our syrup, there's not going to be anything in there. There's not dirt. There's not what we call tree sand or knitter. You get stuff that it's really just dirt that comes out of the tree. Just a little bit of like particles. Right, right. So that cleans it all out. So then immediately we have this this clean syrup. It's going through the press at you know two hundred degrees, you know one hundred and ninety, and then we put it into stainless steel barrels right away. So okay. then all of our syrup goes into stainless steel barrels, um, and then we seal the barrels up. So then that way, when we're ready to bottle into pints and quarts and gallons and things like that, then we we pull it out of the barrels again. Okay, so like I mean, you just seal it in there so it stays fresh until you're ready to yep. package it. Yep. Jeez, that is crazy. Yep. So like the first big year that we did this, where we went from like sort of hobbyist, sort of selling some to like, okay, let, let's jump in head first with this and, yeah. and do this. We we made all of our syrup, put it in stainless steel barrels, and we took it to an auction. Um, so there's like a ma- there's maple syrup auctions. And it's not really an auction because they, they come around, they take the syrup out, they do a taste test, they do like a fr- refractometer test to see like how many parts, you know, like, you know, per million or whatever it is in it. Now you gauge syrup through the, the, the clarity of it, right? Right. If it's light, almost like, a, uh, almost like, I don't know the color of it's amber color right. rather than like a brown, dark color. The amber color is the more quality 
Yeah, right? so the highest level is what they call golden delicate. Golden delicate. Yep, so golden delicate's the highest col- that's the highest quality one. That's like really clear, you know, almost the color of water, but like yeah. just a little bit of like a golden color to it. So, okay. Um, we don't make a lot of golden syrup. Most people that wood fire don't make a lot of golden syrup. Yeah, yeah. Um, then you go to an amber, then you go to a dark robust, then you go to a very dark. So okay. there's there's the international grading of maple syrup. There's the Pennsylvania, there's New York. We use the international one. Okay. So a lot of people ask about grade B syrup. Um, so grade B is part of the master cleanse. Um, you know, so it's you know, cayenne pepper and lemon water and grade B syrup. Oh, okay. There really isn't a grade B anymore. It's a very dark. So like if you're someone that wants really dark syrup or yeah. what used to be grade B, you're going to ask for the very dark is what the, what the new label is. So, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So we, what we do is we actually take a sample out of every, every, uh, every drum goes into a glass and then that has a date with a serial number on it that matches the barrel. So that uh, way we're able to batch our syrup. And, and you're so, able to know what's in there and what's yeah. going on with it. Yeah. So that's actually a, a big thing to Chad from Millie's is he really helped us get it to that next level because we never did a batch system until we started doing work with him. Yeah. You know, and he made a good point. Like if you ever had to have a recall, how do you know what to recall with it? So like we then uh, yeah. said, let's do a serial number off of the barrel plus the date will equal our batch number each year. So then we have a retain sample. So if you come to the sugar shack, there's a fridge and you open the door and there's, you know, hundreds of little bottles that have all kinds of syrup in it from the different days we bottled it. So Wow. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you no, before, no, no. but you were going and you, you were going to the syrup auction. Yeah. And I'm curious about this. Yeah. So you have syrup buy day or syrup auction, whatever you call it. Yeah. You go and it's a giant warehouse and they're there and they're what they're doing is they're testing for those different grades. So they do a taste test. They put it in to see how clear it is and what the color is. Then based on where you fall is a price per pound. So maple syrup's about eleven pounds to the gallon. Okay. Um, so if you look back at the prices of maple syrup, go back to two thousand nine, two thousand ten, the price of maple syrup sat around three dollars and fifty cents a pound. Okay. Um, so last year it sat down, I think, to like a dollar ten a pound. Um, so like what's happened is, you know. 90% of the world's maple syrup comes from Canada. Yeah. So the wholesale price of maple syrup follows the Canadian dollar. So as the Canadian dollar is weakened at that time, if you're someone like you know Kraft who buys a lot of maple syrup or if yeah. you're someone like Bush's Baked Beans, um, you can say, well, I can go to Canada and I can buy it essentially 75 cents on the dollar cheaper than what I can buy it here. So it's driven the prices down. So, ah, okay. so our, our first year we went to the auction and I was like, whoa, 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 like we're not going to make money if we sell it at the auction like this. So we kept some syrup back and we, I said, let's just try like a, let's try a farmer's market. Let's try to put a brand around it. Yeah. Um, so our first market we ever did was uh, the Lawrenceville farmer's market. Okay. Uh, so it was Saturday afternoons we went and people were just so supportive, so responsive, like, you know, to this, our syrup, the quality of it, the product and, um, and then we picked up our first restaurant, which was uh, called Josephine's Toast in, um, in Smallman Galley. Um, so, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she, Jacqueline, Jacqueline um, Wardle, now Jacqueline Shadle, was uh, our first real, like, restaurant account that we picked up. So, like, I was in there having brunch one day, and, like, I was like, hey, where do you get your syrup? And she's like, oh, I buy it from, you know, Pennsylvania Market in the Strip District. And I was like, oh, my family has a syrup business. Like, not sure if you'd ever want to buy from a farm. And she's like, bring some in, and it just kind of went from there. So that's awesome. Yeah. So it was. So then the next year we said, okay, let's let's take a little bit to the auction, but let's hold more back for for the for the farmers markets. Yeah, like to be this. able to sell it. And because um, you're not making too much at the auction, right? That's no. more just you're wholesaling it out to people, right. and they're making the money off right. of it. So you think about it. You went from. You were like a gallon of syrup at the auction. Now you don't have the packaging costs and the marketing yeah. and all that other stuff. But a gallon of syrup at the auction is less than twenty bucks a gallon right now. Yeah. So like that's for your like your very very best syrup. So now you're like, boy, twenty bucks a gallon after all this work I just put into it. Ain't shit. Yeah, yeah. So we then said, well, let's put more focus into the farmers markets, and then you know, and then at that point, I didn't know a lot about the food industry, so I just like started researching it and talking with people. And the one thing I found is every chef knows all the other chefs, all the bartenders know each other, all the GMs. Yeah, and you got to know who's in your fields. Yeah, so we said, you know what, we're going to, my business strategy was, 
let's go out and really build relationships with these restaurants. And like, so what we did was if you bring on Paul family farm syrup at your restaurant. Yeah. Um, so we have our wholesale prices that we go in with. Um, we'll come in, we, we do free delivery. So we either deliver or we work through Penn's corner and, uh, which is a farm Alliance here in Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, so they deliver for us, but once you bring your syrup on, we actually do paid social media advertising your restaurant that you support local farms and small businesses. So like, that's key. So as like, be well, dumb not to do that. Yeah, it helps everybody. Helps now, everyone out. I got more people coming in the restaurant. They're asking for our syrup. Yeah. And so then we, the next big step was we took a, we did what we called our VIP tour of the farm. So we took up, um, so as Jacqueline and her husband, Nate, who are my, you know, dear, dear friends now in Pittsburgh yeah. over last night, you know, for dinner. And um, we took uh, Stephen Eldridge and his wife. He has provision at uh, Federal Galley now. Um, what what is that one? Um, so he was in Smallman originally. Federal's over on the North Shore. I know what that is. Yeah. But what's his restaurant? Uh, it's called Provision. It's but, like right by the door. It's sort of like American style food, like great burgers. I think I might ate there once. Yeah. He does a pan. He does pancakes with our syrup on it. That's just like out of this world. I ate somewhere. I I I never remember it. It's like we went there and just go and get a bunch of shit from different places yeah. and just eat it all. Yeah. So then we were. We, they came up with us, um, the guys from uh, Proper Brick Oven, the pizza place downtown. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, fantastic pizza. Like, And so they came up with us. They make a maple old-fashioned at the bar, ah. um, which they kill it with. I mean, they go through so much syrup in that drink. and then um, That's we, crazy. You don't think, like, what all people use the syrup for. Right, right. I mean, we have quite a few places around Pittsburgh now that use it in cocktails. Like, yeah, I never would have even thought of that. And yeah. I was doing my research and there's a, a big ass maple syrup place in Vermont. Yeah. And, uh, they, they said that one of the biggest things for them was, was beer distributors, like the micro breweries yeah. and everything. Yep. It's like, you got these micro breweries that are using like an insane amount of the maple syrup because it's a natural sugar compared to right. like, uh, the manufactured sugar. And yeah. I was like, damn, that's crazy. We do one with, um, with hitchhiker brewing. Um, yeah. 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 So they do one called woke, which is a morning stout or breakfast stout that use our syrup in it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we did one with, which was a lot of fun. We did it with full pint brewing. Yeah. Um, and it was called the Canadian middle finger. Um, <laughs> so it was like a spruce sale, but they used like Pennsylvania maple syrup and they use like Pennsylvania spruce. And then it aged in wiggle barrels. Um, Wow. which was really neat. Like that was a fun collaboration that we did. Yeah. That's so. cool. Like any of the people that are in Pittsburgh that are like cool, like, you know, hip companies yep. that are willing to, you know, work with other people. Like that's, yeah. I love all that. We do so much of our work. Like it's been collaboration. It's been fun. Cause like I've entered this industry that I don't know a lot of people in. Um, you know, so I don't know a ton of people in the industry, but I've made like dear friends from it. Like, yeah. you know, now like probably my, all my closest friends in Pittsburgh, Oh, excuse me, are like from restaurants around the area or from bars. And it's been neat because like, one, the people in that industry work their asses off. Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, like it's it's always funny, like, you know, with Chad, like I know like if I get text at like five in the morning, it's Chad, like, or if it's 11 <laughs> o'clock at night or like, and then, um, you know, like them and then like Jacqueline and Nate who we're close with, we're, we're really good friends with the people that own Mediterra Bakehouse. Oh, yeah. Um, I got my, uh, I got my wedding cake from Oh, nice. The... What was her name? Was it Andrea? Yeah, Andrea. Yeah. She made our wedding cake. It was unreal. Yep. They, so how we got connected with them is we were at the uh, Mount Lebanon farmer's market. So yeah. she would set up next to us and like you're at the markets in which I have so much fun at these farmer's markets. Cause they just, are awesome. You, you know, can't beat going there and just trying a bunch of shit, right. talking to cool people about different stuff. Right. And it just hanging out with like, hanging out with all these other vendors. And she kept telling me how how her husband um, has a beehive and he wants to keep bees. Yeah. And um, I said, you know, well, if he ever needs help, have him give me a call. Like never thinking he would call. Yeah. And so this guy calls, never met him. And he's like, hey, he's like, I know you've been talking to my wife at the farmer's market. He said, you'll come <laughs> help with the bees. I was like, sure. So like <laughs> these guys now have become like my, like great friends, you know? And yeah. like, so we have two beehives out there at their their house in Roslyn Farms. And so like wow. it's been neat, like this group of people that are like so motivated, hardworking. They and, want like, to do cool things. Right. And they're just cool trying things. stuff. So. Now, now that's a perfect segue. How did you guys get into the whole bees? It, like, is that where it came into play at or did it come into play up at your yeah, spot? So what kind of, it came up, it started at the farm. So like what was, I 
it's, I think the fascination started when I was living in Puerto Rico. So yeah. like, beekeeping there is very different, you know, because like the weather's always nice. You don't have to worry about like snow. Like yeah. there's always stuff in bloom. And I was like, just like, that was probably the first time I talked to people. I'm like, this is so fascinating that these little bugs like make something so delicious. Crazy. Um, so I came back and I started, I read a couple books on beekeeping. Um, and then there's a guy here in Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah. It's called country barn farm. Um, and so he's in Glenshaw. His name's Joe Zagruski, something with a Z, you know, yeah. like, um, but he does classes. So every month he does a class. Then he does like, it's like an hour class. And then he does like an eight hour class. And I went and the guy, he's just, I can't say enough good things about Joe. Um, yeah. just this wonderful guy. So patient. So and they're went, like learning classes. Right. Yeah. To teach you how to keep bees. Oh, okay. Um, and this guy knows more about beekeeping than like you could ever imagine. And like, so I started going to his and like super great guy. Um, and so then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get some bees. So like, so I said to him, I said, I'm offline. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's I how I talked to it. a beekeeper on here. Yeah. And that's the first thing I said. I was like, where the hell do you buy bees yep. at? She was like, you can order them offline. Yep. <laughs> so we, so I bought a hive. My dad and I built it together. We like cleared an area out that we're going to put the bees. And then at home, there's a, there's a bee farm called Drapers. And they're like, it's interesting. You get in these businesses, you meet the icons of the syrup business or yeah. the icons of honey. And like, <laughs> so Drapers is like anyone that's a beekeeper knows these guys. So like went over, I said, can we buy bees? I said, bee pickup day is, you know, May 20th or whatever it was. <laughs> so I like go over my Subaru out back and like, we put the bees in the back. They come in like this wooden box with like a screen on them, like a screen door. Yeah. We drove them home and we read some books and we dumped them in and said, let's try this. And then, um, so we started working that first year we did the bees and like, we knew, we had no idea what we were doing. Like yeah. we were having a lot of fun. And so then each year we've added more bees and like, we've worked with some other beekeepers in Pittsburgh that have just been like fantastic. Like, um, there's one called a Poitia apiary. Her name's Christina Newman. Um, she has all these like infused honeys. Yeah. Like, with the spice, with yeah, the hot and everything. Yeah. I, I've, I've met her at the, I made it market. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, I met her and, uh, I couldn't remember who she was. Yep. So I, I reached out to, uh, someone that worked with bees and yep. someone tagged uh fine family apiary. Oh yeah. And, uh, it turns out I go and talk to her and she went to my high school. That's she was awesome. like a year older than me. And I was like, I cannot believe I didn't know who you were. Yeah. But, uh, she has like she runs a store in uh squirrel hill yeah that has like a crazy like all this she was telling me there's all kinds of bees r around here yeah all kinds of people's working in bees yeah it's it's neat because i feel like 20 years ago if you said you were a beekeeper people would be like who's this weirdo yeah like, yeah exactly but now everyone's just like really like the hipsters eat with yeah. the, like beer and everything everyone's doing woodworking and right. beekeeping right making candles and shit yeah, yeah so <laughs> It's crazy. It is. And like, it's funny. So like my day job's like very corporate -y, very like, yeah. you know, lots of PowerPoints and Excel files and stuff. Yeah. And so I don't really talk about the the side hustles often, but like if it comes about beekeeping, it's amazing how it changes. Like the whole meeting, it changes. Like everybody wants to know and they're fascinated it's by it. It's because it's a difference. It's like it work at the corporate job. That's a necessary evil. Right. That's not your passion project. Right. I mean, necessarily at least it's right. like, and whether bees are or not, it's like that. Those are things that like, that's your getaway. Yep. I mean, you're working 40, 50 hours a week, yep. even though that's work, that's just getaway time. Right. Like this podcast, this is getaway time. Yep. And it's just, it's, it's completely different than the corporate type yep. shit. Well, I said the best thing about beekeeping is, and it is cause you have to disconnect cause you have to be focused. Like you can't go out there like with your mind thinking about 10,000 other things. Do you wear a whole suit? I just wear the veil. Okay. Um, so I'll wear a veil and then usually like, you know, for, I have like a short sleeve shirt on right now. Yeah. That's usually what I wear. I'll wear a long sleeve shirt. Um, yeah. I don't usually wear gloves um, unless we're extracting honey where they get a little excited. My thing is they're like any other animal. If you stay calm, they'll stay calm. Once you put this suit on, you start sweating and you're, you know, you're like getting nervous. That's when they get it wound up. You're too, not allergic so. to bees, are you? No, no. I'm allergic to bees. No. Uh, but I've, you know, it's, it's, I hate sharks. I don't hate sharks as I fear sharks. Yeah. Probably more than anything. And it's just like, I'm most fascinated with them. I'm most mm -hmm. fascinated with bees. Like, I love learning about bees. Yeah. I think it's incredible. When you get you up to the farm, we'll put you in the bee suit, head to toe. <sighs> I listen, I'm telling you, I'll live, I live for all that. Yeah. I, I'm, I couldn't be more excited about it, but it's like, so you guys kind of just got thrown into the B 
bees and just started making honey. Yeah. And so, and how many years have you been doing this so far? This will be our third year. Yeah, this will be our third year with bees. Now, the first year you did this, how much was your yield? Like 25 pounds of honey. Really? Yeah. That's, like, I mean, that's a decent amount. Yeah, I mean, it was like the most exciting day. Like, <laughs> we're like, because all year we're like, what the hell are we doing? Like, yeah. we don't even know. Like, I don't know if it's working. Yeah, or- like, literally I go up there, I open this box, I look at these bees, and I'm like, oh, it looks kind of like the book. All right, yeah. like, text, like, Joe picture. Or, and Does this look right? Yeah, and like, no clue. And it was neat being around, like, my dad and his brothers who are like, so skilled in so many things. They had, had nothing to no do clue. with bees, right? No clue. Okay. So, and they were all into learning about it. So my great grandfather had bees and there's stories about him being like a very good beekeeper. Uh, okay. My grandfather, um, he didn't like them or whatever reason they didn't have them. And then when we came back, like then we brought them back and, um, I'd say it was different levels of interest. Yeah. Um, when I was like, Hey, I got another crazy idea for the farm. Let's put in honeybees. <laughs> and like, you know, my dad's, my dad will be 62 this year. His brothers are in their 60s, you know, like, and um, now that the, like, the maple syrup business is, you know, we're 100% retail now. So we sell nothing at an auction. That's great. It's all through farmer's markets. And we probably work with about 50, 60 restaurants in Pittsburgh. That is and, fantastic. Um, So now it's like went from like very, very like no one ever came to the farm. Yeah. To now like we're doing tours on the farm and we're doing classes. Well, now it's like, a little bit like y- you guys got a little bit of cushion right. to like to it's work fun. with it. It's yeah, like, it got to be fun. So when I did the bees, I, I know they were like, what? Like, we don't have time for this. <laughs> like, I got to cut firewood, you know, like all this stuff. Now, like I go home, we do inspections and like my dad and his brothers do the entire thing. Like, I'm like, hey, can I help? And they're like, oh, no, no, no we got this. And like, they actually have like, little chairs up there. And so my dad and his brother just go up and sit and watch the bees at night. And like, it's, that's awesome. It is. It's like, it's been so much fun. Like, I don't want to say like reinventing the farm, but like really put this like it. whole, yeah, it's a whole update to it. So yeah, I mean, you got to be updating it. If yeah. this has been going on since what, 1860. Yeah. 1865. Like that's insane. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I mean, to be part of, you know, the heritage of that and yeah. to be able to like, you know, be actively involved with all this, got to feel great. Yeah, it You is. know, you're keeping the name alive, keeping the family alive. And it's just like, it's a cool, I mean, it's, I'm, I have that entrepreneurial type muscle that I'm, I'm always trying to think of a way to, to do, you know, to make a move, to like, to monetize something, to, to make some cool merch, to make some cool shit that people want to buy. And it's awesome to be able to deliver an awesome product. Yeah. I made my own coffee for the first time. Yeah. Uh, I roasted coffee with a local coffee shop around here. And I was like, damn, like I I had 20 pounds of it. I I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I was like, I want to sell this. I hope it tastes good. And, uh, I got it all marketed it, got a nice label, got a nice logo. And, it sold in two days, 20 yeah. pounds of it. And that's awesome. It felt better than I've ever felt with anything. Yeah. It's just like, and it's not even that like I got like money for it. Cause I didn't even, I broke even on everything, yeah. but to be able to get it out there and have people hit me up being like, damn, this is awesome. This yeah. is awesome. It's just like, Oh, it gives me a good feeling. Yeah. It's just neat to do something like that. Just, yeah, literally just to do, just do something, something. just yeah. to do something that people respond to in a positive way. Yep. It's definitely cool. So, I mean like the honey stuff is, is like you like that. I feel like that you like that a little bit more. Yeah. I, I mean the maple syrup is like, it's fun and I, I really enjoy it. Like it's, yeah, I, yeah. it's like, it's neat and it's fun, but like the bees, it's just like this whole other level, like of like yeah, to mean, learn constantly and like. It's been fun because we put. I now have two hives out at Roslyn Farms with Mediterra. I'm a, a hive out in Moon Township with a. It's a new winery and restaurant called the Four Twelve Project. Um, okay. Only been open a couple months, but we have bees out there now and talking with other people about putting bees in. And it's just like, it's nice because the syrup you're pretty. You got to have a lot of maple trees. They yeah. got to be really old. You got to have all this equipment. Bees, you got to have a four by four foot square. Yeah, just a box and throw yeah. them in and, you know, don't be afraid. So, yeah, like, <laughs> don't be afraid of it. Yeah. Wow. That's definitely awesome. So, up at your, how, up at the farm, like how many? So, we have 10 hives right now on the farm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you got a, you got a pretty good, pretty good amount. Yeah. And it was, you know, each year we're trying different things and trying to do it different. And so, this last year, again, my dad and his brothers came up with this neat idea that, we had our hives like sitting on the ground and they're kind of spread out. 
what we did this year is we actually built like a bench um, that gets them about two feet off the ground. So one, they're a lot easier to work with. Yeah. But two, it, we literally went from like our area where we we're like, we can't fit another hive in here to now we could probably put double the hives in. Um, oh yeah. Just by raising it up right. and making more. Yeah. Making it level and straight. Ah. The other thing too, is at home because of the bears, you know, and like it's true, you know, poo liked honey. And yeah. so like we have to have an electric fence up around the beehives. So, oh, wow. So we actually got bears that'll come after the honey. Yeah. Yep. So what we, we have a electric fence at six strands. It sits about six feet high. And so we have that around there, but that kind of limits us on where we can put our hives. Yeah. Um, I have a friend, they lost like 13 hives last year to a bear. So Holy like, shit. came through, just smashed everything, ate all the honey, destroyed it. So like fat and happy. Yeah, exactly. So, wow. That's pretty awesome. I mean, yeah. like that's exciting. Yeah. And to have a, uh, to have like this whole different world besides your, you know, your right. boring corporate, yeah. not boring, but everyone's, I, I just say that with everyone it's stereotypical, right? But, uh, it's, it's cool that, uh, it's cool that that's a thing. And like, you got to get away that you can go right back home and kind of break away from it all. Yep. It's like the perfect vacation, you know, like, yeah, gotta be, you gotta go be perfect. And you just work and relax, and there's like, nothing more ideal. It's like uh, my my parents have a trailer uh, up by uh, in Ripley, New York, yeah, and it's like wine country. So it's like you know up there, I'll I'll, I'll go like if if, if I, they just got this and my dad is a, a psychopath he cuts all the grass everything yeah. got to be his way but like i would do it you yeah. know like i'll cut i'll go chop wood whatever you want me to do right because it's not it don't feel like work right but uh that's awesome so what's the next move with all this like what do you what's your hopes and dreams in the next few years with all this yeah you know it's it's ex- it's went so fast and so exciting and i mean i feel like i was like preparing for this making a mental list of all the people to thank you know because it's yeah. like you know, like Penn's Corner has been phenomenal for us. And like, and we're at the Bloomfield Farmer's Market now, which is really a great market for us. And, you know, this weekend we're actually at Picklesburg. Um, Picklesburg. So, yeah. So, okay. which is crazy. I applied thinking they'd never expect accept us because we're a maple syrup farm. And then Why not, right? they came back and said, we'd love to have you. And so we're there. And so actually my dad, too, my, my dad can't make it down, but his brother Tim and his brother Kenny, they'll both be down this weekend to help. That is it. awesome. Which is a lot of fun because like, they didn't they they've never really traveled a lot my dad's brother tim traveled a little bit more but now like get him down to the city and yeah, we're taking him out to restaurants and couple like, mountain men yeah and so they'll be down here for the weekend for picklesburg um, wow what, what what restaurant are you going to take them to i think we're going to do dianoyas on friday night i don't know so, what that or is thursday night it's up in the strip um it's like 24th and penn um they use syrup on the brunch menu. Oh, um, uh, okay but their italian food is just phenomenal you so, ever been to streets on carson I have not. You know what that is? I heard of it. I haven't been yet, but I've heard it's really good. It's unreal. If you get a chance, take okay. uh, take uh, take your relatives there. Okay. It's it's not like a crazy like you don't have to get all crazy dressed yeah. up. You're gonna walk in there and either hear Fleetwood Mac or Wu Tang. Nice. And uh, it's honestly the best food ever. But it's yeah. like if people people that are living four hours away, yeah. you know, he specializes in street foods from around the world. Oh, that's awesome. So it's just like it'll say the type of food, where it's from. And he just kills every single dish he makes. But uh, so let me get let me get back into right. something here. You brought me a whole bag full of goodies, and uh, we're gonna do. You actually brought two different bags full of goodies. So yep. one of them we're gonna do a giveaway. Yep. Okay. Uh, the giveaways that are on here are always they always go well. People just always love free shit. The giveaway we did with Turner's Tea was insane. It had like six hundred and fifty comments. Crazy amount That's of people. Awesome. It was. I was blown away because it was a you know. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, n- taking nothing away from Turner's. It was a t shirt, some stickers, and I bought someone, I, I, and I told them that I would buy them a gallon of tea. Yep. And people went ape shit for this thing. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, anytime, like, it's nothing to me to, like, why not give something away? Yeah. It's like, what the hell? So what do we got here? Run me through all this because you have a bunch of different products here. And I'm, I'm curious about this on how you get into the different products that you have. Yep. So the, so we have our regular maple syrup. So yeah. this is, we have our maple syrup. Most of our stuff sits in around an amber color for the syrup. Um, so Pennsylvania that's a, pure maple syrup from yep. Paul family farms. Yep. So we have a, that's a quart there that we have. Now, how much does this go for? That retails for 18. A quart of, a quart of maple syrup. And like, I mean, I feel like this will last for. I well, mean, it depends how you use it. Yeah. So like, um, I have some recipe cards thrown in there, but like for me, um, 
you know, Chad will hate to hear this, but I'm trying to cut back on the amount of ice cream I'm eating. So yeah. like, um, but uh, no, so I love Greek yogurt with maple syrup on it. Like, really? I've never tried that. Yeah. So I put it on salmon. Um, my friends, Jackie and Nate, they came up with a recipe where take maple syrup, put it in a frying pan, get it like bubbling a little bit, put some like cayenne pepper in yeah, and then toss a uh, popcorn in it. So it makes like this maple Damn. spicy popcorn glaze. Sounds, I was thinking, you know, uh, whenever I was just looking at that, I make a... Uh, like honey sriracha Brussels sprouts. Yep. I bet you that'll be maple Brussels sprouts, yep. something like that. I like to take sweet potatoes and I'll take them, peel them, cube them, put them butter, salt, and then maple syrup, wrap them in tin foil and throw them on the grill. Yeah. And let that it cook great. like that. So like, so it's one of those people. So it depends on how you use syrup. Um, but now, now what's the, now what is the, what's the shelf life of this? Like if I, if this is sealed right now yep. and it's out of the fridge, do you ever put that in the fridge? Is it refrigerating? Yeah, so so right now it's not open. So we bottle everything at 185 degrees. Yeah. So we take the syrup up to 180. So we pump it back out of those barrels, put it in at 185, bring it up to 185 and bottle it. Uh-huh. So that's heat sealed. So when you open it up, there's going to be a seal on it like you'd see like on a medicine vial. So yeah. As long as it's not open, I don't like to say the shelf life is indefinite, but it's it's going to be fine. Yeah, you know, for a like while. Once you open it, you're going to want to put it in the refrigerator or in the freezer. Okay. Um, so I keep mine in the freezer because I like the consistency of how it comes out. It, it doesn't freeze, but it'll get like sludgy. Yeah. So, um, so once you open it, just keep it in the fridge or the refrigerator. I tell people a year shelf life. It'll probably be better than that. So wow. From a, from a standpoint there. So. Just from a safe, safe yeah. year. So I mean, yeah. that's a general rule of thumb. Yep. Wow. So, and I always tell people good rule on maple syrup. If for some reason you ever get mold on your maple syrup, the mold isn't hazardous yeah. you know, that grows on maple syrup. What it is when you have something that's 68% sugar, water will sit on top. That water will get a little bit of mold on it if it sits uh. out warm. Best thing to do, dump it into a dump it into a pot, bring it up to a simmer. The mold will skim right off the top, and then your syrup's fine. Jeez. So. There you go. Yeah. All right. What do we? What's the next thing we got here? Yeah. So after sort of our classic, we say wood fired Pennsylvania maple syrup, we have our bourbon barrel aged syrup. Um, this has been um, one of the most fun things we've done. Now so. this is now from now this the regular maple syrup is in your typical. It's like what would you call it? A maple syrup jug. Yep. Yep. So that's like in a. Like what you think of like an old timey jug, with an old timey crock so. almost, and then this bourbon, this bourbon barrel aged syrup is so official. It looks like something out of like uh, the Patriot. It's like it's wax sealed with a uh, with a uh, maple leaf on the top here. This this looks super official. So it's cool. So we got our we it really came from that collaboration we did with Wiggle, and I said, hey. Do you ever sell your used barrels? I'd love to try aging syrup in a bourbon barrel. We're not the first people to come up with it, but like yeah. had an idea for it. So then we had the um, we got a barrel from them. We aged 15 gallons and it sold in no time. And really? Like, we need more barrels. So like we have Can you not use it like after you do it once? You know, we're so nervous because the taste is so good. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Like, that makes we're sense. like, I don't know what'll happen. So we now are picking up barrels from Wiggle all the time. Like, huh. So, I mean, once a month, we're down there getting used barrels. And that's awesome because yeah. local place. Yep. So it's great. And then they actually take the barrels back now, and they age, they're age. they aging a whiskey in it um, that'll oh, be ready wow. in about a year and a half from now. So, so with the maple syrup, right? So it, the a, residual maple yep. syrup, they're putting the whiskey in there, yep. and it's going to have that flavor. Yep. So it's a bourbon barrel that became a syrup barrel that's now to a whiskey barrel. Wow. So we have some friends at home that make hard cider, and they take some of the barrels and age their hard cider in the barrels. And like, that is that's awesome. not something you can buy. So, like, but yeah. Um, but so the bourbon barrels, um, you know, we do everything, and it's interesting that bottle. Uh, the f- I was trying to think of a bottle to use this for. Um, yeah. And I was like searching high and low, and we went to Pork and Beans, the barbecue place downtown. Yeah. And their barbecue comes in that that sauce, or their barbecue sauce comes in that bottle. Yeah. And so I'm like, this is perfect. And so I like flagged the waitress down, and I'm like, where do you get your bottles from? And she's like, how am I supposed to know? Like, so I spent months like Googling like round bottle with little top and like stuff. And I finally found those bottles. So if you're ever looking for them, they're called a Boston bottle. A Boston as, bottle. Yeah, as the style. Um, so we filled them. 
our first batch, we had a couple that actually got some mold because the caps didn't seal very well. Yeah. So we we're trying to come up with ideas. And so my dad's brother was the one like, let's try a wax. Let's, let's do wax dipping them. So we bought a crock pot. That's like the size of a coffee mug. Yeah. Put, you know, food grade wax beads in it, melt it down, just dip it in one person stamps. And wow. so a lot of work goes into that bourbon syrup. Um, yeah. A lot of to, the work in the packaging too. Yeah. So it goes into one aging it for about, you know, 12 weeks. Then we have to filter it again. Then you have to bring it up to temperature. And then we do everything in those, uh, that size, and then one size smaller than that. So, okay. And then for a couple restaurants, we do it um, in wholesale. So um, provision, we talked about earlier, they use it. Union Standard uses the bourbon syrup in it. Um, really? You, um, you guys are in some pretty prestigious places. You know, I, you know, I have a lot of... Uh, I can't thank some people enough, like Chad being one of them, Jackie being one of them. Um, they were just so good to us to like introduce us to people and promote us. That's and, the like, best thing is once you find a great person yeah. and they could, and they're a great person that yeah. has a legacy themselves and they give yeah. you a chance to shine yep. and you do shine and you succeed, you're, you're in, yep. you got a good, you got a good in, they'll, they'll vouch for you. Now this is. I'm I'm so excited to try that. And whenever we were talking about the consistency of like how thick it is, yep. while I'm looking at it right now, it almost looks like a the the thickness of like a vegetable oil almost. Yep. Yeah, that's like good, that. that's a good that's a good like description of what the consistency will be on it. So yeah, it looks great. So now, what's that bottle retail for? So that's eighteen as well. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, I mean, like that's. I, I would buy that in a second. Yep. Like it's so it's been a great sell. We do a ten. So our smaller bottle is a ten dollar bottle. Yeah. Um, and we say it's like the perfect gift. You know, like it's. I always say it's a great gift. Like if you're going to visit people from out of the area, or like that's a good a idea. Housewarming gift. It's like the perfect thing to take. So yeah, because not everyone like we were talking about before. Not. I think that this is going to be a great episode because you know there. I tell people all the time. I got people that sell drugs that listen to these, and I got people that are managers of big corporate companies that yep. listen to these. So I got a variety of. Of all different people and it's like you know i got people that uh will hit me up every week and be like damn dude like that was a cool episode like yeah. the beekeeper was a great episode uh everyone like chad from millie's i'm sure people will like this because it's like i just feel that i offer a different way to communicate this yep. information to the masses yep. i mean like this is cool shit and like why I i'm sure people would be interested in learning about it especially now with like you know, with the world that we're in now and people are like getting away from the manufactured, like fake sugar and everything yep. like that. I'm sure you got people that are like coming at you yep. from all different groups of yep. of consumers that are trying to find, yep. you know, your maple syrup. I think it's a good quality. And then just like building relationships, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah you're an awesome dude. Like yeah. you, like I honestly didn't know, I never know how people are going to be once they're in here, right. but like whenever I was talking to you online, it's just like, uh, you know, I was excited to talk to you because yeah. you seem like someone that, that is like involved in it and just like loves it and is like submerse themselves in this throughout yeah. their life. It is. It's just like, it's just fun, you know, like it's fun. And I think cause I've got to meet so many fantastic people yeah. know, through it. And like, um, you know, and there's a little bit of an ego stroke. Like, I mean, I love it when I go to a restaurant and see our name on the menu or Absolutely, like, dude, like you got we, to, we took, um, so I took a bunch of people from the corporate job to proper, uh, proper brick house for dinner one night and like we come in and the, the hostess comes over and gives me a hug and they give us free appetizers and so like let's be honest like that strokes the ego quite a bit like. absolutely <laughs> so absolutely for sure yeah. uh so <clears throat> excuse me so we got that bourbon yep and uh i'm excited to try all that for sure yep. and uh the next thing we got here yep so i brought you some of our raw honey from the farm i'm excited um, for that so this is last falls we haven't taken any honey off from this year yet so uh -huh. Um, this is a goldenrod honey, um, which I think is another thing that's funny with the farm because before you didn't want goldenrod. You know, gold, goldenrod was like a weed. You didn't want it in the fields. Like it was a pain. Now, like we said, like we look for that bumper crop of goldenrod because it's so good for the honeybees. Like they, it's a really good pollen for them. It's a really good nectar. They make a lot of honey from goldenrod for, yeah. from it. So looks fantastic. It's a really nice color. Yeah. So we have the goldenrod honey. And then the last thing that I brought, I want to bring something from a collaboration. So this like, is the coolest thing that yeah. you pulled out of there. I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny. So, um, and may, you should get John on the show sometime. Is That's who runs the yeah, Steel name, City Salt? Yeah, Steel City Salt. Um, literally like the nicest guy in the world. One of the nicest people I've ever met. And I would go into the strip. I love going to the strip and just walking around and like, I have time, like, you know, just get food and stuff. And, um, 
So every week I'd stop and talk to John because he's a good guy, has great salts, great peppers, great blends. And we're always like, we should do something together. And he's like, I don't know, you know. And so he's the one who came up with the idea to take maple sugar. So, you know, maple syrup's at 60, 66, 68% sugar. Yeah. Boil it till it's 100%. He takes that and he mixes it with dried jalapenos and pink salt. So oh. you have this like sweet, spicy, salty mix. It's great. Like mix it with olive oil on salmon, put it in sweet potatoes, on chicken. I cannot wait to I'm, – yep. I'm going to open this right yeah, now. Yeah, please do. You got to try it. Just oh. a little dab though first. So, um, but, uh, so This we're is actually, an honest – this is going to be 100% honest. Yep, honest. If it tastes this like shit, nervous now, so. I got to tell him. <laughs> so pinch of this one. Mmm. It's neat. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Mm. I could definitely taste the maple and the jalapeno right. in it. And you could ta- obviously taste the salt in it, but, man, you put that on anything. It's fascinating to me how he – because, like, we make syrup and honey. It's one ingredient. Mm. There's, you know, like, there's not a lot of chemistry or anything. It's just, like, you know, syrup's just syrup, honey's just honey. Yeah. How he's able to take that and first, when I taste I taste the maple – then I taste the the heat, and then I taste the salt. Like yeah, it's almost absolutely. three it's distinct stages. You definitely so. taste the sweet in the beginning, and then you get a little bite, yeah. and then you could taste the salt over it. Yeah. So we do we we do a lot of collaborations with people, and you know we've done a couple different ice creams with Millie's. We've done some beers. We've done, um, you know, this is a big one. We've done some mead with Kingview Mead before. Um, we love doing collaborations. I mean, that's just it's fun. It's unique. It, you know, it's helps just, out both people. Yeah, yeah. So like, that's what I mean. Our business is a lot of built around just relationships and you know building that out with people to do different collaborations. And that's so. the best part about a you know a smaller family owned business yeah. is that like you can get down to the right the the thick of like who created it and right. really like sit down with them rather right. than like you can't approach someone like. You know, I can't go to Permanis and be like, yo, let's do this right now. Right. It's not as simple. Right. But if you, I mean, like, you guys are, uh, you know, you're easily, like, contactable. Right. And, like, you guys seem willing to do cool shit oh, if yeah. someone has some cool shit to do. Well, it's, you know, I, I, the story, I loved it earlier this year. So Chad calls me one night and he says, hey, he's like, there's this woman, it's called Yummy Holics is her, her Instagram page. Yummy Holics. Yeah, and she makes these cookies. They're like the most lifelike cookie you could ever imagine. And um, he's like, I wanted to put my face on a cookie. And my wife said, like, you can't put your own face on a cookie and give them out. Like, that seems kind of egotistical. And he's like, so I thought, why don't we put your face on a cookie? He's like, you can scoop ice cream. And I was like, done. Like, I'll be there whatever day these cookies are ready. So, like, I left work, went home, changed, went straight over there. Him and I scooped ice cream. And it was great because I was scooping ice cream and giving out these cookies with my face on it. And people would look at the cookie and they'd They're look like, at me. Who are you? And they'd be like, is that you? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and um, then I like get to work the next day and like people are coming by my office. They're like, I swear to God, I saw your face on a cookie. Was that you? And I was like, it was. But anyway, to your point, that's what's so much fun about this. Yeah, it's, it's like, fun. You know, like, hey, I got this crazy idea. Maybe it's a total flop, but let's go do it and have a good time. Yeah, so. you got to, right? Wow. So, I mean, like, I mean, that's the next move is to just keep expanding and keep making right. shit happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I never, I don't think we want to get to a point where we're like, you know, some of these people that, you know, 40, 50,000, 80,000 taps and oh, trucks yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. You know, I think that we can grow it, you know, probably up to eight, 10,000 taps. We can get more bees in. Still attainable for you guys to right. handle without having to involve right. a bunch of different other right. people. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get to a point where we hire employees and stuff. I want it to still be family and because, it is this great time of like during sugar season where we're all in the sugar shack together. There's lots of food. There's always coffee and we're just having this great time, you know? And it's like, if anything, like one, like, I mean, it's all really thanks to my dad and his brothers. Like these guys like work nonstop. I say, I get to do the fun stuff. I like eat and drink and, you know, bullshit about the syrup, (laughs) but they like, they're just such great guys. And it's so much fun to see that. And I don't want to lose that, you know, but I want to get to the point where, we get more people up to the farm. We'd love to do some events there, you know, like, and yeah, that would be awesome. You know, it's a beautiful 250 acres on top of a mountain and like just to, you know, that's where we want to get to is like, do, do a little more syrup, a little more honey, do some more events and, you know, and just keep growing the business. You know, I think it's, it's been neat. We now have, you know, we have a website, we have a newsletter, we have, you know, social media that I'm proud of. And yeah, so, I mean like that's, you have to have social media nowadays. Right. You got to, right. especially if you want to tap into different, uh, different groups of people that, you know, 
whenever I think of people that are out there looking for maple syrup, I think of like older women yeah. that are like going to tea shops or something. Yeah. But nowadays it's like, why not? Why wouldn't people want right. that? And I think it's more or less just like putting it in front of them so they could see it. Yeah. You know, like I find myself buying hot sauce, buying like seasonings. Me right. and my wife went to uh, Salem for our honeymoon. Oh, nice. And uh, we went on the, we went on a, a spice and coffee tour. Okay. And it was all around the harbor right there. And it was just, we went to different coffee shops, tried different coffee. Yep. They explained shit. And then we went to this store that was a, th- this guy, it was all seasonings. Yep. It was an entire store of just seasonings. Yep. And like, I love learning about shit like that. Yep. She loves learning about shit like that. I feel like other people want to learn about shit yep. like that. I feel like it just got to be communicated to people the right yep. way. Um, damn. I feel like I was a great conversation. Yeah, it was. Is there anything that we missed talking about honey? Or uh, talking about bees or honey? No. Or is, syrup? I feel like, you know, we cover a lot. I think it's, you know, I just, um, you know, my, I'm I'm really, like, it's just, it's been so much fun the last I mean, it's always our family's very close. So, like, yeah. when you come up the dirt road to the farm, you go two miles up, you come to the original farmhouse where my uncle lives. You come to my parents' house. The next house is my aunt's house, and then my uncle's house, and and then you're two miles to the next farm. So it's like their little Kennedy compound. And like, my dad and his younger brother are like best friends, you know. And I said like, I was trying to do the math. I literally think they've worked over a hundred thousand hours together because they've like worked together since they've kids. I've always known I, them together. They had to. And um, it's like. And then, like, you know, we joke my mom's like a celebrity. She works at the only bank in town. And, like, <laughs> but the whole family, you know, my, my aunts, my uncles, my sister, um, my mom, like, it's been so much fun, like, doing this. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I'll be excited when they listen to the podcast and everything. But I just, I'm so happy and it's, it's just so much fun. And, you know, and then, you know, my, um, my my fiance probably her biggest fear in the world would be coming on a podcast. Yeah, and like this is like <laughs> all week. I'm like I've been telling her, I was like Aaron, I'm going on this podcast. I can't wait. And like, um, you know, we couldn't do a lot of it without her. You know, she just comes with like she's a level setter. She's like and her eye and a lot of the great pictures we have are hers. Our our best social media posts are always pictures she takes. And yeah, like, it's been neat because I'm sure that when we first started dating. She did not see her life schlepping maple syrup all over Pittsburgh and like I bet. So um, you know, just a lot of people to thank, you know, like, you know, the some of the people listed earlier, Penn's Corner has been great with us. And um, you know, I just can't say thank you enough to all the people that have supported us as we've took this from like small hobby to a business to hundred percent retail and you know, and I mean, you know, just just happy and thankful. So absolutely. I'm pumped about it. I'm glad that we can't cross paths. All right, so I do an ending segment with all my guests. I do an ending segment with them called Desert Island Questions. Are you a fan of The Office? I am. I am. So I get Desert Island questions from The Office. Uh, They get locked out, and then they play. So uh, I give each of my guests three categories to take with them on a Desert Island to uh, watch, read, and listen to over and over and over again until they die a painful death. Uh, So... The first category is things to watch. So you get three choices. It could be anything. It could be movie series. It could be whole TV series. It could be whatever. You know, it's so I'll tell you the the one show. Well, I should say this. I'm not a big TV watcher. And I know like so I actually until um, until Aaron and I moved in together, I hadn't had a TV in years, years and years and years. Oh, yeah. Never like we had it growing up. I was just never a big TV watcher. So. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you that um, th- I love the like. There's one like BBC does that show that's like Planet Earth or whatever. Yeah, they did another one called like Human Planet, and it was about people that live in the most remote parts of the world. Oh yeah, and it was so fascinating. Yeah, I love like, all that stuff. So that was like that. I really like that show. Okay, um, I I really like that. Um, you know, I I love the movie Rocky, the first one. Yeah, you, know, you can't like, not. Well, I mean, I love the whole Rocky series. You, you know? can't but, not like, love. The the first rock. Yeah. And like, so Aaron had never watched it before. I made her watch it. And, um, you know, and you have to tear up at the end. Like, Got I would to. say it was never about winning. It was just making it 12 rounds. Yeah. That's all they wanted to do. Yeah. So that's like, all he wanted to do. So I, I, I love, <laughs> I love, love watching Rocky. And then, boy, 
you know, I, I'm trying to think, but the only one that comes to the top of my head is Smokey and the Bandit. Okay, yeah. Like, that was, like, my favorite movie from the time I was a little kid. Burt Reynolds. Yeah, like, it, when Smokey and the Bandit's on, like, I'll sit and watch it. You know, but, like, the movie Casino, like, I'll always oh, watch yeah. that. I'll All always day. watch uh, The Godfather. I'll always watch American Gangster. Like, I love Blow. Like, maybe there's that theme of, like, those crime ones. But, yeah, like, absolutely. It's just, like, there's the movies that always come on. Yeah. And Shawshank Redemption, that was yeah. another oh, one that's yeah. always on. And yeah. I, that's, that's, that's in my three. It's yeah. just, like... So much good shit. All right, so you got the Planet Earth, you got the Rocky. Smokey and the Bandit, and you got Rocky. Yep. Those are three good movies. Yeah, I don't know if any of them have ever been picked on here. I don't. I think I could. I'm trying to think of things. If I'm on that island, I could watch those every day. Yeah, every like, day. That's what you got to think about yeah. because some people will be like, "Oh, I watched." You know, Stranger Things the other day, and I'm just yeah. like, but could you really watch it every day? Yeah. That holds no nostalgic factor yeah. to you. I and love I feel watching- like you have to have nostalgic oh, yeah. factor, and and if not, you're gonna you're gonna jump off a cliff or yeah. something there. Airplane, like I can watch Airplane and laugh out loud yeah. every time that it's on. So <laughs> that's a good one. That's yeah. why. Uh, those are good choices. Though. I like those choices. All right. So do you read now? I do. I do. Okay. So three books to take with you on a desert island. You know, so I read a lot. Like it was crazy because growing up, I didn't like reading. I didn't like reading. And I was not an adventurous eater. And now I eat literally anything. And like, oh, yeah. I probably have, if we went out to, if I grab my backpack, there's probably four or five books in my backpack. So like. How many books you read last year, you think? <sighs> I'd say 50 to 60. Holy shit. So like. Wow. Um, okay. I just enjoy reading and for a lot of different reasons. So anyway, um, probably number one, probably the best thing I've ever read. I was like so in just engaged in it was the book Lonesome Dove. Lonesome Dove. So like a lot of people know the mini series that was on like in the nineties with like, um, and it's this story of like these two old cowboys and it's like their last cattle drive. And like when you hear it, you're like, this is going to be cheesy. It's going to be dorky. I'm going to actually won a Pulitzer Prize, which is like impressive for a novel. Um, and it's like 900 and some pages. Oh, really? And um, I read that book in three days. Like I like. It was that good. Yeah, I could not put it down. I was like literally like at work, like I read at lunch that day, like I was reading at the dinner table. And I remember you get to the back and you're reading these different um these different quotes. And the one author said, it's the only time I read a 908 pages and I was upset the book was over. And like, wow. So like whether you're a Western person or not, like Lonesome Dove is just this phenomenal story. Lonesome Dove. Yep. Okay. So I really like that. Um, there's a book called Endurance. Um, Endurance. Endurance. So it's a story of Ernst Shackleton. He was the first guy to try to go to the South Pole. Um, oh, okay. So, um, this is during World War One. They get amnesty. They're supposed to be there on this two-year expedition. Very early in it, the boat boat gets destroyed, and they live as a crew in like you know at the South Pole for years. They rebuild a ship. He sails it like across the ocean, gets to a whaling station. They take him to Chile. He commandeers a ship, goes back, and he saves every person. So like no one dies. Holy from it. shit! Like it's hard to believe when you read the book. Like that. Is that that's actually, true? Yeah, it's a true story. Holy so, shit. Look, I'll send you, I have a cop. I have so many copies of endurance. So like, <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll get you a copy of it and it's dry at first, but the story's just like that man. lonesome dove. It does. That does sound like something I'm into. You should. Lonesome I love dove. Westerns yeah. so much. Like, uh, I think about it and, you know, I, I talk to everyone about this, about like the desert Island and a lot of like some of the, my favorite movies are Westerns like, uh, 310 to Yuma. Oh yeah. Might be one of my favorite movies of all time. Yep. And then you have like movies like the quick and the dead. And, yep. and it's like, those are movies that people might not find to be their favorite, but I've always loved oh, Westerns. Yeah. I know. love true grit, like both oh, the original yeah, one yeah. and then the and one that Jeff Bridges yeah. in there. Those are both fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I, but I do, I, I thought three ten to Yuma. I just watched it again recently. Yep. And, uh, that's just like one of the best movies yep. for sure. Uh, Russell Crowe. Come on. Oh yeah. Yeah. Can't beat that. Um, plus a great ending. Yeah. Uh, all right. So you had, you had endurance, you had the, la- the lonesome, lonesome dove. dove. Boy, this is a tough one. Um, I'm trying to think of maybe like something more recent I've read. Um, I really like this book called grit, grit. Um, by Angela Duckworth. Um, so she's, so I'm very fascinated by like what they call behavioral economics or like decision-making 
Actually, I think I'll change it. I'll change it from grit to this book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay. Um, so Thinking Fast and Slow is by Daniel Kamen. And it's this whole I, this whole thing about like why people think the way they do. And so like I'm very fascinated by memory, you know, like how I can remember things so clearly and the person that was there with me like remember something completely different yeah, or like yeah. doesn't remember it. And neither one of us are liars, you know, like or like how you know, someone the other day was like, tell me this story. And I was like, I don't remember this at all. And they remembered it so clearly. So yeah. like, this what, guy, what is impactful for people, right. and how people register their memories and stuff. Right. So it's pretty interesting. I'd say thinking fast and slow. It's, it's not an easy read. Um, it takes it's, but it's a lot about this guy's life research, um, about why people think the way they do, why people like how you have self biases and like, yeah. it's just really, really a fascinating book. So I'd say those three. So, all right. Those are good choices. Yep. Um, and the third category is things to listen to on a desert Island. So I'm, it's, I'm a huge, I really like music. I'm a big music fan. Okay. Actually in college, I had a radio show like that. Did was, you? Yeah. I did. I did as well in CCAC. Oh, nice. I, uh, I copied my name off of the full house, uh, radio show called them, called ourselves a rush hour renegades. Nice. But, uh, I did. I had a radio show. Nice. I, mine was caveman's classics. That's um, awesome. I had much longer hair and a big bushy beard in college. Oh yeah. You oh, had yeah. long hair. Oh yeah. Long, long curly hair and this big, big beard and all right um so it's called caveman's classics and so um you know probably number one's easy exile on main street by the rolling stones oh yeah that album is like i don't know how many times i've listened to it like start to finish end to end it's yeah. just like this fantastic album all right that's a good one I'm, I'm definitely familiar with that yeah exile main street um you know that's number two gets so difficult like there's so many like i think of these albums like end to end and so like I think about like Jim Croce's album, My Name is Jim Croce, just sort of like this simple album. Yeah. Um, you know, like Blood on the Tracks by Bob Dylan oh, yeah. is amazing. I think that uh, someone just picked that not long. Someone just picked that. It might have been, it might have been the last guest from yeah. uh, Adam from Penn okay. Mac. Nice. Uh, the Wild, the Instant, and the East Street Shuffle is great by, uh, by, um, uh, by Bruce Springsteen, like one of his first albums. Huh. But I want to pick something that most people probably haven't listened to. So I'd say, I would say there's a Waylon Jennings live album. Waylon it's Jennings. Called, it's called Waylon Live. Okay. And it's like, it's just this like country rock album from like the peak of his like 70s outlaw. That's and straight authenticity. Every, yeah. Like it's just like as, as true as it could be. And it's just this amazing album. So I think I'd pick number, I think I'd do Exile on Main Street. And then I think I would do that Waylon Live. So. All right. And, and I think number three, I think I'd probably do Jason Isbell's Southeastern album. I don't know who that is. So um, Jason Isbell sort of like this Americana, alt country. He used to play for the drive-by truckers. Oh, yeah. Um, I know who they are. So they actually kicked him out because he had a lot of drug problems and alcohol problems. Yeah. He like leaves the band, divorces his wife who was in the band. And then he gets sober and he wrote this album during his like rehab and sobriety. Ah, okay. And it's just like this amazing album. Like the music's phenomenal. The lyrics are great. It's like this like song of redemption and like, you know, ch second chances. And um, so I saw him in Atlanta at the Fox. And so this was shortly after the album came out. I still yeah. remember the first time I heard the album. And so I saw him at the Fox in Atlanta and he plays this song. It's called cover me up, which is like the, the his sobriety song. And it says something like a, uh, you know, I swore I got sober this time and swore it off for good or something. And like the crowd went nuts and like stood up and started cheering. And it was like this like amazing like musical peak moment where you're like goosebumps and yeah. like he stops playing because he gets so emotional and like so that's probably it's an amazing album and I think that paired with it. So I'd say Eggs on Main Street, Whale and Live in Southeastern. I flew to California last week to go to go uh watch one of one of my favorites. This band, uh The Ghost Inside. Okay. Four years ago, they got they were driving in the middle of the night. Got a eighteen wheeler wrecked right into them head first, killed their both drivers. Uh, drummer lost his leg. Uh, the rest of the band had all these terrible injuries. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, no one ever knew if they were going to play again. Yeah. And then a couple years later, their social media picture changes, and everyone's like, "What the fuck is going on?" Yeah. 
and they're like, what is going on? Is this new music? Because like these dudes are all messed up. The yeah. drummer doesn't have a leg. And, That's uh, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And then uh, they they announced you know one night only show in wow. L.A. at the Shrine Auditorium, and uh, me and my buddies went, and it was just like you know them breaking in between songs, talking about you know, the, the trials and the tribulations that they had to deal with. And, like, they were saying that the drummer's dad helped engineer this, like, pedal for his son. That's crazy. To play these drums. And, like, in the middle, they're talking about this. And they're like, oh, and, and Andrew's dad, Larry, you know, he made this all happen. He engineered this thing. And this entire crowd's chanting Larry. And you're like, what the hell? And like, That's awesome. I just got tears rolling down my face. And I'm like, this is crazy that we're here. Music, man, it yeah. gets you. Definitely does. Nice. Um, all right. So the second to last question that I ask everyone is death row meal. So yep. you could pick whatever you want from wherever you want as much as you want. Man, you know it's uh, so I've, I have to I have to say I've listened to the podcast like thinking about this answer. Like, yeah. Some of your other guests, and um, you know, like I think about some of my favorite meals and that I've had here in Pittsburgh and as I've traveled around. And, yeah. Like, but I gotta say, like my death row meal is gonna be venison and pancakes. Venison and, and pancakes. Venison and pancakes. So together, together. So I've never had that combination. Yeah. So um, growing up, we ate a lot of venison. A lot, a lot yeah, of venison yeah, growing yeah. up. Um, and, Which is uh, great. It's yeah, great. Yep. And um, you know, so I and you know there were some there were some lean years on the farm, and you ate a lot more venison on those years than yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, that that year round season. So like. <laughs> um, but uh, my birthday dinner as a little kid was always venison and pancakes. And so as a little kid, like you're five years old, six years old, like venison and pancakes, like what could be better than this? You know, you put like, in your maple syrup oh, yeah. on top of all yeah, this venison? Yep, yep. So we make venison. My dad always, uh, when we do this for my birthday dinner, it would be, we do tenderloins, you pound them out, oh, yeah, bread them, the you know, bread them in, you know, flour and salt and pepper, fry them. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought you meant just like, you know, a piece of backstrap on a grill. Oh, yeah. No, because oh, my birthday wow. is December 20th, so it's always right before Christmas. Oh, man, that's so, the best. Yep, so do these like pan fried and like salt and pepper and flour mm. with pancakes and maple syrup. And like, one, it's like this childhood memory, but also like we still do it every year. My birthday, we have that for dinner. So, like, that would be my death row meal just tons of pancakes and maple syrup and venison. That's great. I would definitely try that yeah. for sure. Um, all right, that's good. That's a good answer. And, uh, you know, uh, I never asked you what's in the cup. I do another segment. Yeah. It's called what's in the cup. And I usually do it in the beginning, but we just got the yeah. ball rolling so good. So what's in your cup real quick? Yeah. So I, you know, tap water. Yeah. And I know it's like the most boring thing. That's you can all right. Imagine, so. I asked you, I said, what do you want? And you said water. And I said, well, what kind? And you said tap water. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> All right. And you were like, I'm not boring. I just like tap water. I was like, all right, that's fine with me. It's a good answer. So I, so I, it's funny. So one, I drank a lot of water growing up on the farm. Like yeah. my, my, my dad and his brothers and everyone was always so strict on that about like staying hydrated while you're working. We have wells on the farm and like the well water is just like delicious. delicious. Sure. And so like, it's just always like this memory of like coming in and just like drinking this ice cold glass of water when it's hot after you've been working. And then, um, when I lived in Puerto Rico, we had a severe drought the one year I was there. Really? And um, so it's interesting. Most people you would think you'd never get a drought in Puerto Rico. But yeah. like, we had this severe drought. Um, we got to a point where you only had water every five days. So it started because the government runs the water there. So Damn. it started with like you'd have water Monday and then Wednesday, then Friday, and it went on this rotation. Then it was like Mondays and Thursdays. And I got to a point where you had it like Monday and Saturday. And, um, wow. So like, until you've lived where you don't have water, you like, don't know how much we take it for yeah. granted. And so then now my most recent thing is every morning before I walk out the door, the, the last thing I do before I like run off in the crazy day as I just get a cold glass of water and I just take a drink of it. And I just take like 10 seconds and be like, I'm just going to enjoy this glass of water. Yeah. Be thankful for what I got and then go off to the, you know, the excitement. I like it. That's, so, good. That's good. Yeah. So my very boring What's in the cup? That's all right. Tap water. That's all right. So, all right. So, uh, the last question that I ask everyone is if you could have a conversation with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? You know, that's, that's a really tough question. Heavy. It is. It's heavy. You know, like, cause part of me like wants to go to like 
my my great great grandfather who settled on the farm and just be like well i'll i'll make this easier for you i'll let you have a loved one okay but i want someone that's not a loved one okay so usually people will pick a loved one like i would yeah. pick my grandfather but i would also love to talk to robin williams yeah uh so you can pick a loved one and a uh and a someone that you don't know so so we'll we'll take away from that one if i'm thinking about it like Someone current day that I find super fascinating is Malcolm Gladwell. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I I love his like approach to thinking and like I I just super think, interesting. Yeah, like it would just be interesting to like pick his brain on a lot of stuff. I've listened to him on Rogan before. Yeah, I like. Um, he has a podcast called Revisionist History. Um, that's probably my favorite podcast right now that I listen to. Really? So, um, it would probably be like him or um, I'd love to talk to Geronimo. So like oh, yeah. the uh, like a uh, last Apache warrior and so that would be awesome. A couple years ago I was like flying for work and I thought to myself I know nothing about Native Americans outside of like they lived in teepees <clears throat> like you know like yeah. nothing. And so I s- picked up a I picked up a Native American book. Um actually the first one I picked up was called The Apache Wars and it's like the story of like the very first settlers all the way to Geronimo's death and like in like this very unique spot. And then I've read all these books on native Americans since then. Um, so it's like my fascinating when I'm not reading like novels or business books, I'm reading, you know, usually native American history books. And like, it was interesting, you know, that Geronimo, like till the very end was like this warrior. Yeah. He surrenders, you know, the last couple of years of his life is kind of like a farmer and kind of a sideshow. And like on his deathbed, his last words, you know, supposedly is I should have never surrendered. Like I should have never quit fighting. And like, it would just been interesting, like this guy's like lifelong story. That would be fantastic. It would be, be incredible to talk to him. Yeah. Um, have you ever read the Blood Meridian? No. It's a. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is. I was told about it. I have a terrible uh, habit of buying books that yeah. I fully intend to read, but I have never gotten around to read them yet. Someone told me there's a medical diagnosis for this. Of uh, like buying books that you never read. Yeah, like, I'm <laughs> sure there is. Yeah. I just I'm a collector. Yeah. I like to collect and I like to have you know, I could buy a I could buy a damn Kindle and have hundreds of books on there, but right. I love to have the physical copy. Yep. It just makes me feel better. But uh, you know, I, again, like you said, like Native Americans, like you don't know too much about them. I really don't either. And I had a dude on here named Brian Ganella. Okay. And he is a street artist. Okay. And uh he was in um uh, I think like Arizona or somewhere, but he worked, he did like an art uh, exhibit on a uh, reservation yep. and he was telling me all about like, you know, this reservation was like the size of Texas and like they had all these like abandoned, like broken down buildings and shit like yep. that. And the, the part of the art, uh, like exhibit was they were bringing in different artists from all different places to like do street art on these abandoned buildings. And he said that while he was doing like his job was to like prep all these like walls and everything. And like, while he would be prepping them, he would see like, you know, the elders come over like the older women and the older men yep. and they would come over and like, he, uh, like his, the guy that was like the, the brought him there who was like part of the reservation. He like introduced them and, um, uh, he Brian Ganella walked over and he would say like you know nice to meet you nice to meet you and they would just like they wouldn't say anything to him yeah and he was like huh like why and he asked the guy he was like why do they like not like greet you back and he was like it takes three years for uh, uh, Native Americans to be able to decide if they want to say that it's a nice to meet you because they don't know if you're going to be a burden on their lives or right it, that, like they they really put their time into that process. They have to know someone before they say like, good to meet you. Yeah. And like, I was like, damn, that shit is crazy. Yeah, that is. It's, it's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool to like, to, to hear that whenever he told me that, cause like we were just talking about artwork and that popped out and yeah. like, that was my favorite part of the entire conversation yep. is like learning about that. That's just so fantastic. Um, but all right. I mean, like, that's a great answer. I mean, I really enjoyed our podcast. No, this was awesome. Yeah. So. Like I had no idea what, you know, a talk about maple syrup would have came out to be, but I honestly could not be more happy with how this came out. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for inviting us and taking time. Absolutely. And, Take any time to promote yeah. anything you got to promote. Yeah. I would, you know, I would say we, um, you know, we got Picklesburg coming up this weekend. I don't know if it'll be out before. Yeah. That, this is coming out Thursday. Okay. Nice. So yeah. So if you're out and about, come see us at Picklesburg. We're spot 39 underneath the pickle. Okay. Um, so we got the Bloomfield Farmers Market coming. We do that out just about every Saturday, and so all right. Um, we have our website, but honestly, like you know, if 
we love working with people. We love sharing our syrup, you know, and if you guys ever, if there's anyone out there that wants to do a collaboration or anything, just feel free to give us a call. My name's Travis. And so I do our social media and our website. So if you send something in, you're going to get, you're going to get me with the info. So, but, That's and I great. think just a, a big thank you to, you know, so many of the chefs out there and the restaurants and people that gave us a chance, you know, like when, Absolutely. when we were just like, literally like I'm this guy coming out to eat and drink, like, you know, but I always said like, who else is out there like hustling maple syrup like at the bar? That's what like, I'm saying. Like, <laughs> as soon as you were like, "Oh yeah, we have a fifth generation maple syrup farm," yeah. I was like, "Yep, got to hear that." Yep. Yeah. So it's <laughs> just like it's interesting. You know, so many good people that we've already listed on here, and like, what's I mean, the Instagram at Paul Family Farms? Uh, Paul Family Farms PA. Paul Family Farms PA. Yep. Or Paul Family Farms Spa. Depending on how you look, uh, how yeah. you look at it, so like, <laughs> which we've had a couple of people contact us about the spa, so, so <laughs> not yet, but you know maybe in the works soon, so, soon. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, definitely follow. You can scroll yeah. down below. I'll put everything. I'll put the Facebook. I'll put the website. I'll put everything else there. Where could people buy the buy your uh, your maple syrup and your honey? Yeah, it's a great great question. So if you're not um, if you don't see us at one of the farmers markets or events, um, yeah. the Fair Coffee in the Strip District. Um, right okay. next to Kaya. Um, they always have our product in stock. Uh, the Inn on Negley carries quite a bit of our product. Um, okay. Penn's Corner, if you're not familiar with Penn's Corner in Upper Lawrenceville, it's a it's a farmer-owned cooperative. So there's probably about, I don't know, 35, 40 of us farmers from all from Pennsylvania that own this cooperative. And it's all local farms, small family farms, and that's a food distributor. So they distribute to a lot of restaurants for us. Um, like recently they, uh, we just went to bar Marco the other night. They had our, they brought our stuff in there and they do a, uh, what's it called? The, the smoky something. I don't know. It's like scotch and maple syrup. And so, um, but Penn's corner, um, always has all of our products in stock. So I'd say find us at a farmer's market, go to DeFair, go to, you know, steel city salt. They have our stuff in their Millvale locations. Yeah. So, and that stuff I'm excited to yeah. use that. So there's always good places. I'd say check out our website, our social media. We stay pretty active and, you know, but love to see it at a farmer's market somewhere. So. Absolutely. You could tell he's a great person. Go mingle with everyone. Um, I do got to say one thing. So absolutely. There was, there was a sto- there's a story that there was a big argument that Chad wanted me to tell on the air. And my fiance said, do not tell that story. Tell so it. I can't. I can't. She'll kill me. Why? But I just want to tell people when you see me, I'll tell you the story in person. So oh, you can't do that. I'll, I'll tell you after we're done. All right. That she, works. She, 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 uh, and I'll tell you why she gets frustrated over it. So it's that a makes sense. Though. Um, Okay, I'll allow that. That's good. Uh, everyone else that's listening, appreciate it as always. We got awesome shit going on all the time. You know, there's so many good people around the city. Uh, you want some maple syrup? You want some honey? Paul Family Farms. Yeah. Uh, at Paul Family Farms, PA on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram at I'll Call You Right Back. I'll call you right back across the boards. Uh, I got so much shit coming up. Uh, a lot of good guests, a lot of good stuff that I want to do. This is about to be episode 80. I mean, 20 more and we'll be at 100. I'm definitely going to do some crazy shit for that. So uh, give me a second and subscribe and rate and review the podcast. That's the biggest thing you could do for me. If you don't want to buy shirts or stickers, which I do have, and they're all great quality and they're all very nice, just give me a rate and review and I would appreciate it. I'll call you right back on Instagram. Thanks again and I'll call you right back. <laughs>